um, round of meetings. So um, I'd like to welcome the Mayor, fellow councillors, the CEO, Brian Pigeon, uh, General Manager Stuart Summers, all the staff here and all those people watching online. So um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Aboriginal parties whose song lines traverse these lands we meet on today, the Western Waka Waka, Gaibal and Jarrawa, Jarrawa peoples and pay respects to Elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the knowledge, rich traditions and bold ambitions of Australia's first people. So do we have any apologies? We have no apologies today. That means we move to item three, which is the changes to proposed amendment number 20. And I think Peter Swan, our senior planner, is going to speak to that today. Good morning, councillors, fellow officers and members of the public. On the 10th of December 2019, council proposed amendment number 20 to the Toowoomba Regional Planning Scheme and proposed amendment number five to planning scheme policy number six, heritage places. On the 6th of March 2020, amendment number 20 to the Toowoomba Regional Planning Scheme was su submitted to Queensland Tre Treasury for state interest review. On the 15th of May 2020, Council received feedback from Queensland Treasury requesting further information from Council and or changes to the amendment to appropriately address three particular state interests. These being heritage, matters of state environmental significance and scheme workability. The scheme workability uh, item was in relation to the proposed changes to the table of assessment for operational work. A councillor information session was held on the 10th of June to provide councils information on the feedback received from Queensland Treasury regarding the heritage and matters of state environmental significance, state interest, and outline options to resolve the matters. The, the outcomes of the information session and the feedback from Queensland Treasury was reviewed by Queens, um, Council's planning scheme review team. In light of this, this report recommends that proposed amendment number 20 to the Toowoomba Regional Planning Scheme be changed in the way identified in the recommendation to appropriately address the state interest. This report also recommends that the related proposed amendment number 5 to Planning Scheme Policy number 6, Heritage Places, be amended to align with these changes. The changed amendment number 20 to the Toowoomba Regional Planning Scheme will be submitted to Queensland Trinity Treasury to finalise the state interest review. Any questions? I'll just back up and um, apologise for not recognising my councillor colleague, Councillor Carl, as portfolio leader in Pounding and Development. Now, any questions? Or queries? Councillor Summerfield? Thank you, Madam Chair. So, I'm, I'm just curious, when uh, there was a requirement that we make, ch change, make these changes, um, did that include that it needed to be on the list of local heritage places, the first two, the direction from the Minister? Um, it, it's an interesting one because if planning scheme policy number six, had, if we propose that change independently, the, that doesn't go to the uh, Queensland Treasury for state interest review. If we had removed the place from the, the list of heritage places, and submitted the amendment 20 as is to Queensland Treasury, um, they wouldn't have had that issue because it wasn't actually on our list of heritage places. Um, so because it was on our list of heritage places still and it hadn't been taken off and because we submitted it to Queensland Treasury, we were required to either demonstrate that it doesn't have the heritage significance or remove it from the amendment. And th this report recommends removing uh, the, t the two, uh, Westbrook Homestead and um, uh, Giambi from the amendment. Retaining them? Yeah, we're retaining them on the list of local heritage places but removing them from the actual amendment, yeah. So they get re they're, they're not part of the amendment anymore and nothing happens to them. So they'll still... Place. Sorry, I'm just trying to get through my head. They'd still be on the... Um, local heritage place. They'll be on yeah. the local heritage places and they will be also on a state heritage list as well. Yes. 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 So, in other words, we could have actually... Um, if we were to choose at some stage down the track to remove them from the local heritage place, we could then go back and get it changed at a, at a state level. We could independently change the planning scheme policy, yes. 
there any further questions? Councillor McDonald? Happy to move the okay. recommendation. Councillor McDonald moves. So I have a seconder, Councillor Carl. All those in favour? It's carried. So we move to item four, which is the adoption of the regional planning scheme amendment number 17. And um, our principal planner, Heath Martin, is here to speak to us about that. Thank you, Heath. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning, uh, councillors. Late in 2010 and in early 2011, the Toowoomba region saw devastating flooding um, across many parts of, of our regional council area. And in response to that, very soon after uh, those flooding events, the council decided to undertake a body of work to better position uh, this region for future flood events, to help us better understand um, the, the nature of flooding across the region and the risks that exist. That body of work has resulted in uh, a number of outcomes. Uh, there's been engineering works undertaken to help reduce the risk of flooding in some areas. There's been improvements made to disaster management uh, procedures and, and uh, responses. responses. Um, and also Toowoomba Regional Planning Scheme Amendment number 17. The amendment seeks to uh, ensure that flood, the flood risk is appropriately addressed whenever a development is proposed within an area subject, potentially subject to flooding, in order that uh, people and property are protected in the future. The planning scheme amendment has been undertaken in partnership with the community. There's been four separate public consultation pro processes um, throughout the development and uh, of this, this planning scheme amendment. It's been undertaken using the best available data and best practice methodologies. And I guess in recognition of that, um, Council has received state and national awards from both Flood, Flood Management Australia, uh, Floodplain Management Australia and the Planning Institute of Australia. We've now received approval from the Minister for Planning to adopt this planning scheme amendment, which is the last step in the process. Uh, and if adopted by Council next week, the planning scheme amendment will come into effect from the 21st of, uh, of August, um, after we have undertaken some training with industry and staff to make sure that everyone is fully prepared for it to commence. Um, this has been a significant body of work this morning, uh, over the last eight years, um, and I commend the recommendation to adopt the amendment to you. Thank you. Thank you, Heath. Um, I have to concur that the, um, the amount of work has been extensive and, um, and keeping in mind that ultimately it's for the safety of our residents that, um, that we have gone and done this work. So is there any questions for Heath? Councillor Von Hoek. Thanks, Madam Chair. Through you. Um, thank you, Heath. Yes, I agree. There's been absolutely tremendous, exhaustive uh, work done on this and I really commend the... Uh, level of community consultation. I loved hearing that we went to such levels such as meeting with landholders and saying, okay, this is what we think the, this is where we think the flooding has come to. And they'd say, no, it came a little bit higher on the windmill. I love that level of community engagement and I really applaud that. Um, Madam Chair, I've got a few questions. The first is um, page nine of 11 of our report. Um, uh, it's regarding the compensation. So I just want some clarification, if I may. Am I correct in saying that one year from next week, if this is adopted, um, people who are wanting to seek compensation have to lodge a, de a development application? And if approved, if that DA is approved, they can't claim compensation. And if council refuses the DA, they have six months to make a compensation claim? Um, yes, the, the process for seeking compensation is, is quite a, uh, a complex one. Um, and the first step in that process is that um, a, someone who wishes to seek compensation uh, asks council if they can actually apply for development under the rules that applied prior to this planning scheme amendment com coming in. So that's, that is they, they want to apply under a superseded planning scheme. Uh, if council agrees uh, that they can apply under the superseded planning scheme, then that's the end of the process um, because the changes that are, have been made um, wouldn't affect that application and so compensation isn't uh, a relevant issue. If council says no, um, we, we don't want you to uh, apply under the superseded scheme, we want you to apply under the new rules. 
um, then they have a further period within which they can make uh, a development application to council to develop that land. And depending on the outcome of that application, uh, if it's considered that the, the decision the council makes um, has reduced the development level of development that could have happened on the land, uh, if the uh, planning scheme hadn't, be amen hadn't been amended, then the, uh, the applicant can seek compensation for that, for that loss. So, um, so in, in essence, yes, the, the process that you've outlined is, is correct, but it's, it is a, a complex one, yes. So, oh, Councillor Von Hoff. Thank you, Madam Chair. So those are very, um, would, you, would you say it's fair to say that those are quite uh, strict timelines that people have to be aware of so that if they were to try to claim comp compensation? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, uh, people need to make themselves aware of those restrictions um, and not expect that there is a, a, basically an open window through which they could seek compensation. compensation. And then, and then um, also seeking clarification. So we're talking about 2,366 properties and they're in Cooyah, Crow's Nest, John Darien, McLagan, Oakey, Quinlow and Yarraman. Um, those are the affected properties in this compensation clause. So the, the planning um, legislation generally allows for compensation to be sought where a planning scheme has been amended resulting in a loss of value in property. However, the state government has recognised that councils have a duty of care to the community to protect their communities from the hazards relating to, to natural hazards, flood, bushfire and landslide, and that doing so um, and having to pay compensation for dealing with that natural phenomenon um, can place a significant financial burden on the community. Uh, and because it is a natural phenomenon, the, the state government has said, if council has fully explored the alternatives that are available to, to dealing with this issue other than through uh, a planning scheme amendment and consulted with the community in doing that, then the council can be released from that uh, requirement to, uh, or that, that uh, need to, to pay compensation for that loss. So council has um, undertaken those steps but only in relation to those seven communities that you have identified. So in adopting this amendment, um, that uh, exemption from compensation would apply to people who are affected by this amendment within those seven communities. That exemption would not apply to any other area which is affected by this amendment because council hasn't undertaken the necessary steps to be exempt from compensation for those areas. One other question, Councillor Von Hoff. I'm not restricting your questions. I just want to make an opportunity for anyone else to ask questions as well. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So then um, I, I refer to page 10 of 11 of our report where we're talking about the, the purpose of this, um, of this amendment. And it says, the purpose of the amendment is to protect people and property from the impacts of flood through the identification of land having a flood risk and the application of appropriate development controls. So my question is, how does exempting council from paying compensation fulfil that purpose? Um, I think the, the exemption in itself um, doesn't fulfil that purpose. Um, what it does is it, it, it releases council from the financial burden of protecting the community from a natural hazard. Thank you. Thank you. Heath, if I might ask a question. Um, when we had to go back out and um, to public consultation, and um, just, I suppose it's a follow-up from Councillor Von Hoff's question about the, um, about the process of um, applying for a DA in a certain time, um, was that, as part of that as well? Was that, were the residents advised of that? Um, yes, so the, um, yes, the, the residents were advised that uh, part of the reason for council um, going to, to community consultation was to address that compensation issue and uh, the, the nature of uh, how, how um, the process for applying for compensation should it, it be available to them, yes. Okay, thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Antonio? Uh, can I, I'm not working, 
hope you can hear me, but can I uh, ask you, is this, this would no doubt inform the insurance industry in respect to um, uh, insurance generally, I presume. Uh, yes. It's so comprehensive, there will be people who find their insurance policies will probably go up. And some go down. Yes. The, um, the, look, two of the concerns that have been consistently raised by the community throughout this process are impacts on property values and impacts on insurance pricing. And so we have uh, consulted closely with the Real Estate Institute of Queensland and the Insurance Council of Australia to fully understand uh, those issues and, and how uh, what Council is proposing would affect um, people in, in that regard. The Insurance Council of Australia uh, had said to us that after the 2010-11 flooding, basically the, the insurance industry blanketed the Toowoomba region with a high flood risk designation. And so most property owners were paying um, high insurance premiums because of that. And they said um, that is, has largely been because of the inavailability of, of, of more detailed information to help them better understand what the flood risks were across the region. Uh, and that uh, having this information available to them would enable them to better identify areas that were subject to the flood risk and apply insurance premiums regarding flood risk to those areas and not, not others. They, they did an example for us in uh, Yarraman uh, and identified that there were about 500 properties in Yarraman at that time that were classified as having a high flood risk uh, for insurance purposes. Um, but after in, uh, analysing our flood risk information, they believe that that would probably come down to about 50 properties. Um, so what we should see is that uh, people's insurance across the region should actually be reduced as a result of this. M many people um, and it's probably unlikely to go up because insurance premiums are, in regard to flood risk are already very high. Councillor Shine. Uh, yeah, just to, in relation to uh, page uh, uh, nine again, uh, in relation to the compensation applications, um, it's, it says that the undertaking, this must be undertaken within 12 months of the planning scheme amendment becoming operational. Um, what, if any, notification to those likely affected uh, areas uh, is proposed to be given uh, in terms of making this known? So everybody who is affected by this planning scheme amendment will receive a letter from Council uh, should Council adopt the amendment, um, identifying that the, the amendment has been adopted and how that affects them in terms of uh, the flood risks that now apply to their property and any proposed zoning change uh, that, that is proposed to be made. Um, so that, that's about uh, 13,000 letters that will be going out um, across the region um, following a council decision. And that will state they have to make the application within 12 months? Um, look, at, the, at this stage it wasn't intended that we would go into that level of detail in that letter. Um, however, if, if council uh, want to see that, that level of detail included, then we can certainly make that. Yes. Well, there's no other way a person would know about it unless they're listening today, perhaps, or pretty remote. That fair, fair point, yes. Uh, Heath, could I just seek clarification? Just when I asked that question before, so that, that information was included in that original community consultation, though, was it? Uh, yeah, it, thought, it was, yeah. um, yes. So this is not the first time that people will hear about what the requirements are? Uh, certainly, yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor thank Chair. you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Heath, for that good e explanation. And uh, it's worth noting, I suppose, that we're thinking about this, that not all these areas are able to be developed in the planning scheme or in any future planning scheme for some of these uh, some of these areas. So it's not... Um, uh, I, I guess that there'd, there'd be a difference between the ones that are able to be developed and the ones that are actually rural land or something like that in some of the smaller townships. So. I, I suppose um, rather than sending, uh, you know, so many thousands of letters out, w w could we re granulate it down so that we could find the people who may be affected by, um, that have that ability to develop at this point. And I'd just also like to mention that my insurance has actually already gone down um, because of, um, and we're on the top of a hill. So what Heath is talking about, it did happen after the 2011 and 12 and 13 events that we had here, that the blanket 
in, in increase in insurance just happened regardless of where you are because we didn't have that information. So there'll be more people that will be have less insurance, I believe, than will have be paying more insurance premiums. But I wonder, the question I suppose, I'm rambling on, I do apologise. Uh, the question is, um, not everybody who will be affected by this would have had development rights under our planning scheme anyway um, for, the, for the area in which they live. Uh, would we be better, council be better? It has been spoken with these people when we were doing the consultation. Would we be better to just target those ones with, um, that have that ability at present? Um, you're correct, Councillor, in that there are um, <coughs> most of the, the people who are affected by this amendment will have very little change in the development potential of their property. So they'll they'll be able to they'll still be able to develop the land. They'll just need to do it in a particular way to make sure that the flood risk is addressed. And some people um, may not have been able to develop their land uh, either because there was a known flood risk on the property or because there are other factors that are affecting the property. Um, look, it's probably going to be very difficult to narrow down um, who we actually uh, understand is, is specifically likely to have a compensation claim or not. Um, and so I, th I believe it would be better just to, to send the same information to all affected people. And if I could just have a follow-up, I mean, we're not, we're not causing any hazards, we're just identifying what has always been a hazard and a risk to the places where we're map mapping. That's right, and, and most people that we've spoken to throughout the multiple con uh, consultations have said to us, look, I, I know my property floods, um, and we're just acknowledging that. Mm. Thanks, Councillor Taylor. Call me cynical, but I didn't really think that the insurance premiums would come down somewhere, but <laughs> it's good to know, Councillor Carl. I'm happy to move the recommendation. I'm happy to second it. Thank you. Well, I might just go to Councillor Von Hoff just quickly before we do that, yeah. Okay. Do I have a seconder, Councillor Taylor? All those in favour? Well, you can have discussion, but... I can have a discussion now. Okay, yeah. Councillor Von Hoff, sorry. Thank, thanks, Madam Chair. So, um, I understand that the state has awarded us this provision, or is allowing us this provision to seek exemption. But just because we can doesn't mean we should, um, in my opinion, and sometimes our legislative... Yes, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering whether we're moving into debate there, Councillor Von Hoff. Um, so could I perhaps have someone speak in favour of the motion? You moved it, Councillor Carl. We've already had a vote. Hello. Sorry, my chairing we skills. We didn't actually go ahead with the vote. I just allowed Councillor Von Hoff to um, speak and perhaps we're moving into debate here, so. So, Madam Chair, can I just ask this through you to the CEO? I was under the impression that we had a vote. Uh, the vote was called for, but then it, the, um, the chair stopped that process. Not everybody here indicated their vote at that point in time. So, my understanding is that it, it, it's just that the chair stopped the stopped the process and just went back into the debate before the debate before the vote. Thank you. So, in light of that, Councillor Carr, would you like to speak to the motion? We're debating. Yes. Okay. So, I think most of the points have been more than aptly covered this morning. Uh, uh, one of the points probably bear out here is in the minority of cases, um, it would be most unlikely that under the superseded planning scheme that there would be an approval granted anyway for high risk areas in flood because they've always been in flood areas. This process is really just brought a level of transparency across um, those areas and for the benefit and safety of our residents across the region. And as already has been highlighted, um, it's taken away the blanket approach or the cross subsidisation of many people who pay insurance um, to subsidise those um, uh, in high risk areas or the potential for development in those high risk areas, or should I say limited uh, potential. 
um, in those high risk areas. So um, I <coughs> recommend uh, this to councillors, um, given the extensive and having been involved in that process last term, and as some of the councillors around this table would have been as well, uh, involved in the many community workshops across the region and information sessions, uh, and there was a plethora of information. Uh, and we even went to the extent of proofing that with the uh, residents across the region um, via um, photographic evidence, historical evidence, uh, as a layer even above the technical uh, GIS and other methods we employed to arrive at these mapping um, details. So I uh, strongly commend this to um, uh, councillors. Thanks, Councillor Carl. Is there a speaker against the motion? Councillor Von Hull. Thanks, Madam Chair. So I can't speak highly enough uh, about the level of community consultation and the thoroughness of the work of Toowoomba Regional Council officers. And um, I second everything that Councillor Carl said about that level of detail and, and real effort to make sure that we have robust flood mapping. That's absolutely commendable. As I was saying, my, my um, objection to this is not concerned with that, it's the compensation aspect. And as I was saying, I understand that the state has um, given us the opportunity to seek this ex exemption. And I come back to just because they say we can doesn't mean we should and sometimes our legislative requirements are the lowest form of right. So I will, I support everything in this amendment apart from that um, compensation exemption and so for that reason I can't support this motion. Another speaker for, Councillor Summerfield. Thank you Madam Chair. Um, I am in favour of this having experienced the process and understanding what we did in that second consultation period. Um, however, I would like to move an amendment and that be that 2B also include that in the correspondence to the uh, impacted landholder, the affected property owners, um, the second last paragraph on page nine of the report be included, which is in relation to the seeking compensation application process. Okay, thank you. Um, we have that as the, um, the motion. Um, vote on the amendment. Vote on the amendment. Happy to second. Okay, thanks, Councillor Shine. Um, all those in favour of the amendment. Councillor Shine. Okay, so thanks, Councillor Summerfield. Um, was there another spoke, speaker against? Um, Madam Chair, shouldn't point of order. Shouldn't you have asked the mover and the seconder if they agreed with the amendment and then gone You're to a right. vote after that? Councillor Taylor, my chairing skills need some brushing no. up on. No, no, thank you. I, I appreciate. No, I appreciate. Yes, that's true. That that's the process. That's true. Thank you. I mm. So we voted on the amendment. Now we vote on the motion. The amendment. So we'll just do that again. All those in favour of the amendment? That's carried. And so the motion now includes the amendment. Okay. So we had no further speakers against. Councillor um, McMah McMahon, sorry. For now, or yeah. thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well done on the chairing, it's rather complex. I um, appreciate the work our staff have done and this has been a labour of love for many years uh, in regards to this. I uh, speak similarly to Councillor Von Hoff that whilst this is necessary and needs to be done, perhaps the how regarding the compensation needs a little bit more work. And uh, At this stage, I'm not happy to speak for the motion. Another speaker in favour? Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this mapping and consultation, and uh, like Councillor Carl and a lot of people around this table, we were sitting here. This went on for years and years. As I said, the hazards weren't put there. They were just identified. And I guess that um, the, whole, the whole of Council was involved in that. And um, the compensation... The State Government doesn't give compensation for mapping that they do, that... Uh, 
we would not have had to go through this except that there was a uh, some um, abnormality that we did the first time we did, which is why it's coming back now. I think that council, uh, in some cases, there's still opportunity for compensation to be given. Uh, if someone has had a, a border block of land that is totally covered with water, I mean, really, um, the locals actually know what we're doing with this is, um, is identifying for people coming in, wanting to develop, even people wanting to buy a house in an area. So the compensation, the state government, it's quite normal and uh, they give that, they pass that down to local government. So I, uh, we would have not had to go through this again except that there was some sort of an ab abnormality. And Heath, you might comment on that. Uh, the first time it went uh, before, we had to go back because we hadn't mentioned something. Uh, the state government, um, uh, are you aware of what that was? Stuart, you might. There was an abnormality there, mm -hmm. and so we had to go back out to that community, to the people involved again. Um, could you explain that to us, please? Thank you. Um, yes, through you, Madam Chair. Uh, the planning scheme amendment was submitted to the state government for approval um, last year, and reviewing the process the council undertaken, the, the minister for planning noted that uh, council had not. Um, appropriately notified uh, affected landowners about the compensation issue um, when it had done earlier consultation. Uh, and so the council undertook further consultation to address that issue and, uh, and fill that gap, uh, which was done late last year, and council considered submissions um, coming back from that consultation in, uh, in February this year. So, um, so that, that was uh, a gap in the process and the council filled late last year. Thank you, Ruth. Is there any other speakers against the motion? No, would you like to sum up, Councillor Carl? Yeah, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Just very briefly, um, I stress again in the interest of transparency, uh, we, this, this, uh, we do this. As has been stated, the hazards have always been there. Um, and the comment about the state allowing council exemption from compensation. Let's not differentiate between uh, who pays here. Who is council? Mm. Council is the community. Is it right that the community pays uh, for those high risk areas to be developed or not developed? as in compensation. Is that right, that those costs are spread across the community? Um, it's, it's, it's all right to say the state has allowed exemption, but who pays? Council is the community. I don't think that's fair. I think in the interests of transparency, in the interests of uh, protecting everyone uh, and not defraying that cost across uh, a general rate base, then we need to address this and I go back to the very beginning of the term, uh, or before the last term. Um, some of us will remember around this table, uh, it was mandated that we undertake these flood studies because uh, it was not sustainable to keep replacing property that was built, both public infrastructure and private infrastructure, that was built in high risk areas under a planning scheme. So that's why we undertook this. So I commend this very strongly to councillors uh, and I'd be happy to stand up in front of the community and um, speak to this because this is a very sound, sensible and uh, well thought out exercise that this council has gone through over eight years, Heath. I commend it strongly to you. Okay, with that, I put the vote including the amendment. All those in favour? Carried. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, I request a division of the vote. Okay. Question? Okay. Oh, not in the committee. You might, yeah. Thank you. Um, so, councillors, we move to item number five. Now, um, Councillor Carl and I have had some discussions about, um, which is the charges resolution, <laughs> and um, since this came to council in October of last year, there has been some changes which the new council has not been briefed about, and we felt that um, since it is on policy that it would be um, 
wise to try to um, withdraw this and to bring it back to the August round of meetings. Madam Chair, defer is probably defer. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Just I'll second that. Thank you. Okay. So, Councillor Carl, you're moving that. Yes. And Councillor Carol Taylor is seconding it, and we'll bring it back to the August um, meeting. Thank you. Just, um, oh, the vote. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you have to forgive me. All those in favour? Thank you. That's carried. I'll get there at some stage, won't I? Um, so no, item number six now is a uh, request for waiver of infrastructure charges in relation to a development per for, permit for material change of use, um, Jindarian. And we have Jeff Broad. Oh, Natalie's going to speak to it. Thank you. Sorry, Jeff's unavailable this morning. So Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so as um, Councillor Megan suggested, this... Um, is a, a request for an infrastructure charges waiver and it relates to a low impact industry use at 22 Rutledge Road, Road John Darien. The re um, this request relates to a, a infrastructure charge of 30,750, which was transferred to rates as a debt last year. The outstanding infrastructure charge was picked up as part of council's recent infrastructure charges audit in response to that registration of the rates debt, Council received the current request to waive the charges from Parryland, who is the owner and developer, on the basis that they have now ceased the use. Notwithstanding, in accordance with Council's policy, the charge remains due and payable as the use did commence. Um, there is no um, Council policy available to officers to recommend a waiver or a discount of the charge. So hence the officer's recommendation was to refuse the request. Um, notwithstanding, um, the officer has provided a number of alternative um, recommendations um, in the report should council wish to consider those. Question if I might. Councillor Taylor, Carol Taylor. Um, this use, despite the fact that they say that they no longer have it, whatever, the use still stays with the land. So it is still able to be some time in the future used for, um, for, for for these purposes? That, that's correct. Something similar. Uh, the use has not been abandoned. Whilst they did request that the approval be cancelled, okay. we're unable under law to cancel the approval because it did commence. There are a number of um, conditions which remain outstanding um, in association with the use. Um, and you will note from the history outlined in the report that there was a fairly substantial history of um, non-compliance, unlawful commencement of use um, associated with the activities on the site. And being one of the few of us around here would remember this very well, so, yeah. Any further questions or comments, Councillor Sumfield? Thank you, Madam Chair. Look, I'm quite concerned about the process that's been followed with this particular item. Um, it, it was one of the undiscoverable infrastructure, undiscovered infrastructure charges and all the others that um, were discovered were dealt with differently to this one and I'm just concerned what why we have chosen a different process for this particular one versus all those others that went in confidential and were discussed in confidence um, um, so that we could have a full and open discussion about them and they were handled differently to to this particular one and I just wonder whether that can be rectified whether it's too late um, but I am concerned about the process taken with this particular item. This is a um, I'm not sure. Um, this is the ordinary process that Development Services deals with infrastructure charges waiver. There may have been some other process, and Stuart might be able to give comment around the infrastructure charges audit, um, but I'm not aware of um, those considerations. Yes, look, um, once an infrastructure charge goes to the, um, um, is sent to the rates department, it, it then is op it operates under the Local Government Act, not the Planning Act. And uh, therefore, you know, we're dealing with this under the Planning Act at the moment, and therefore um, it's not something that would normally be considered in a confidential meeting. Most activities relating to the Planning Act and DAs and infrastructure charges uh, have to be dealt with uh, under the Act uh, in public meeting, you know, public meeting. Councillor Sumpel. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Natalie and, and Stuart. Um, the process um, that would normally occur with these undiscovered infrastructure charges is that it gets transferred, as indicated to uh, by uh, Mr Summers, that it gets transferred to the rates notice, and that way it can be handled confidentially. This one, for some reason, wasn't transferred when discovered, as the others were. So I'm just wondering... Um, and I understand why you, you're confused too, Natalie. It's um, uh, they're normally transferred to the rates notice so that people can't purchase those properties unaware of the infrastructure charges outlined. Um, and that's what's occurred in this instance. It's been transferred to the rates. Yeah, and this one hasn't been. And so that is my question: is no, why this one wasn't transferred? It has been. Well, if it has been, it should be handled in confidential, as indicated by Stuart. I might just get the CEO to comment on that, Councillor Summerford. <coughs> uh, councillors, under the Local Government Act, there's certain reasons that you need to, that you can use to close down a meeting from the public. And I'll ask for those to be put up behind you here. Um, so you, can you please tell us which reason you think that um, you, you would need to close down this meeting? Um, Mr CEO, the, um, it's in actual, the, the, um, it's not actually to do with that, if I could explain. It's actually to do with the processes that occurred, uh, which was um, most of those, well, pretty well all of those infrastructure charges that were outstanding that were discovered were transferred onto rates notices. And in, in doing that, when they're in, on the rates notice, it can go into confidential. But for some reason, this particular one was not transferred onto a rates notice at that time and therefore could not go into confidential. Makes sense. Regardless of any circumstances, they are the lawful reasons we can close down the meeting. So you need to satisfy, is there one reason there, any of those reasons that this particular issue can't be? So that's that's the decision that council has to, has to make. And I, I, I can't see if there's any reason there that you would need to close down the meeting. So if that being the case, on the reverse side of that, why have we done all those other ones in confidential? So that's an issue we can look into. It hasn't anything to be relevant to this meeting. What I was asking for. Madam Chair, can I make a comment? Yes. Um, I think th this is resulting out of a development application. I believe this particular one. The others were actually mostly units and just building. And well, yes, but not. Yeah, but not the application for the business. It was the. I don't know. I'm just trying to find a. I do agree that we have had a lot in closed sessions. Councillor Summerfield, um, the um, clause of number D, D up there, rating concessions, would you, do you, would you like to pursue that in terms I of... I seek guidance from the staff because I'm going back to the fact that the previous ones all went into confidential because they were transferred to the rates notice. Um, but this one wasn't transferred to the rates notice in time, although someone just said it has been transferred to the rates notice, and if that being the case, then it should have been handled in confidential, the same as all of the other waivers, if, I, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. It could. Will the comment fine? Won't you? Speak? I, I don't think this is actually a rating concession per se. It's a. It's an infrastructure. It's waiving an outstanding infrastructure charge, isn't it? Um, no, this has now been transferred as a debt to the rate, so it sits on the, as a charge on the rates notice. So there's a potential that it could be considered in confidential under D, their rating concessions. I think the complication here is that it's wrapped up in the land use itself. They, they're wanting to close the land use down. So it's, it, it, it's caught in between those two. But we, we're be basically dealing with this under the Planning Act, though, are we not? We are considering this as a, a waiver of infrastructure charges, but it is now recorded as a debt, a charge mm, on the rates notice. So it in fact falls in both camps, which is pretty unusual. So I think there is an opportunity that we could consider it under D, rating concession and closed meeting. I think you need to go back to um, should council's decisions be transparent? 
in relation to this issue, um, when, when Council applies infrastructure charges, I understand that that information is available through the, through the um, as public information, the infrastructure charges that relate to each, each um, property. In fact, here, you're providing reasons why that particular use um, should not be paying infrastructure charges, so it's the reverse that supplies. Um, normally, that, that is totally transparent. I think it, if Council's making a decision why this person should be, oh, sorry, this um, property and the owners of that property should be having a benefit beyond what other infrastructure charge, people who pay infrastructure charges, I think for transparency, um, it would be appropriate. I don't see um, any issues that, that would really require that this be shut down. So, Carol Taylor. Thank you. I uh, just um, just reiterating on this this decision of council that was made. There were submitters because this in, this prop, this business was, as is shown by the chronology here, was conducted uh, illegally really and had impacted on the neighbours mm -hmm. in that area. So, uh, the very things that they expected to happen when we made that. Uh, decision to allow that business to go forward, uh, the the road and those other things haven't been done. So I think that it is quite different to some of the other uh, ones we've, um, albeit that uh, the, probably the only reason it's not still happening is because the coal seam gas industry has, has uh, taken a, a, a step back. Uh, but that's not to say that it won't uh, reinvigorate in the future. I just also need to, uh, councillors need to be aware that this report is already in the public arena, so they've read all of the reasons here um, and the re they have access to the report at this stage. Um, I'm just wondering what would be discussed behind closed doors uh, or would need to be discussed behind closed doors that can't be discussed here. I couldn't see there's anything particularly special that needs to be cl uh, discussed behind closed doors. We had some meters and... Councillor Summerfield. Yeah, thank you. Uh, look, I don't believe there's anything that needs to be discussed behind closed doors. For me, it, it's a case of processes um, to ensure that we're treating everybody equally. And um, given that previously um, infrastructure charges that have been transferred to rates notices have been done in confidential, um, why not? And I agree wholeheartedly with the CEO that all the information's already out there and yes, there probably is little, very little or if anything that needs to be discussed in confidence. It's, it's uh, in confidential. It's about ensuring we have um, the same process for all of the, um, these mm -hmm. infrastructure charges that have been undiscovered in the past coming before us, that's all. Yes, thank you, Councillor Summerfield. Councillor Carl? Given the... I, I appreciate the... Uh, comments, but given the process and that there were submitters, it was a very public um, process in the beginning. Um, unless there's any further questions, I'm happy to move as per the officer's recommendation. Okay. Do we have a mover for the recommendation for the motion? Do I have a seconder? Councillor Carol Taylor. Okay. Councillor Carl moved. Um, no further discussion, Councillor Shine. Uh, if, uh, just, uh, just a question uh, in terms of uh, deciding in my mind, anyway, what's fair result here? Um, what were the infrastructure uh, works to be done, and have they been done? Um, as I mentioned earlier, this isn't my report, but my understanding is that there's a number of outstanding roadworks um, conditions, and they haven't been met. I'm not in a position at the moment to detail those to you, but I can um, take that on notice. Broadly speaking, council hasn't incurred the expense as a result uh, of the... No, no. The, the obligation was on the developer to undertake some um, conditions which required external roadworks. Okay. Okay. Is there any further... Are you happy with that, Councillor Shine? I am. Yep, thank, thank you. you. Uh, so we have a uh, mover and a seconder. All those in favour of the recommendation of the motion? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It's carried. Thank you. Uh, we move to item seven, which is uh, the development assessment, regional development applications for May 2020. And uh, General thank you, Madam Chair. Um, 
Yeah, basically um, this month there's been a, a bit of a continuing drop. Um, I'll really just talk to graph 12 again. Um, the, uh, we had um, um, basically 49 houses approved and two units. Um, which is, uh, is which is down on the previous month. Um, we also had eight new uh, residential lots sealed, and uh, uh, sorry, we had eight new lots approved, and we had 57 lots sealed, and uh, 57 lots uh, onto the market uh, in May. So. Um, that's, that's up from zero new lots uh, in April and 15 lots sealed. So at least that's heading in the right direction. But uh, if you go to graph 12, um, you'll see that the, uh, the two trend lines that are there um, are basically continuing uh, the trends from previous months. That, uh, the, the value uh, line is... Um, continuing to be fairly steady and the um, number of uh, approved buildings uh, is continuing to decline. I would say that um, given the uh, surge in uh, land sales that has been going on over the last month or so uh, since the federal government's announcement of the grant, of the $25,000 grant, uh, I would anticipate that the building uh, numbers will start to increase over the next couple of months. So uh, I would hope that happens. Um, I might leave it there. Uh, are there any questions, councillors? Stuart, I had a question about the 57 lots sealed. So is that... Um was that due to, is that over a number of developments, a number of um, projects, obviously, or it's not just one? It's, it's possibly one stage of oh, okay. a subdivision. Okay, yeah. right. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, not really clear sure, yeah. Okay, this, but, okay. Uh, that most uh, residential stages would be between 40 and 60 lots. Okay, so it's possibly just one. I, I suppose what I was getting at was um, whether it was a direct result of the federal government incentive? No, no. these figures That's actually too early. predate. Yeah, okay, yep. thank you. Um, my other question was about, which I can't find now, of course, about the temporary um, incentive scheme, the economic development, uh, here it is, the new temporary incentive policy applications for the period um, of May and June, and about the, um, are you across what that is? Or whether, I just wondered whether you could speak a little bit more it's no, um, in graph, not graph, um, number nine, the table number nine. Yeah. I might have to take that okay, on thank notice. You. Thank you, Stuart. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Councillor, I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Any other questions, Councillor Shine? I, I think uh, Mr. Uh, um, Summers uh, uh, referred to uh, an expected uh, increase in uh, building applications probably in June. Those figures are not available yet, or, or there hasn't been any applications too early to to tell. But uh, just uh, you, you base your uh, information on anecdotal. Absolutely, yep. There's there's been a bit, uh, I think, a surge of a better that I that I have heard of about 120, 130 lots sold over the last month uh, across the region. That won't start to feature in the figures probably until July, August, I would say. Um, June would be too early. Um, the federal government, my understanding is the federal government is trying to operate that $25,000 grant through the state governments, and state governments are only just getting the act together um, in terms of being able to deal with the many, many applications that have already uh, come in, apparently. So, uh, but. Um, I, I suspect that we'll start to see a change in this month and next month, July, August. W would you anticipate any, any delay as a result of that increased number in terms of the ability uh, to process uh, those applications? Uh, there's no problem at this stage, certainly in terms of building. A lot of, a lot of this activity will be building certification and that 
would be shared uh, in our region anyway uh, between certainly council certifiers and uh, the three or four other private certifiers that are uh, in the market in the region. Okay. Sorry. Councillor uh, MacDonald. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. To you, Stuart, the great question, Councillor Shine, in regard to that, and you've sparked my interest, Stuart, in regard to those numbers, albeit unconfirmed, but uh, the trend that seems to be appearing as a direct result, one could argue, with the uh, accumulated $45,000 that's available for first, first home buyers. And I guess, um, as a region, we're bucking the trend by the sounds of things, right across Australia. You know, the May, the Federal Treasury was talking about around a 16% drop in, um, in household consumption. Um, so, and of course, following that, a month later, the Federal Government announced $25,000. And I guess it's a, a watching brief for councillors in regard to the amount of activity uh, that's taking place. Uh, and particularly, we look at civil works contracts, perhaps, you know, uh, in regard to subdivisions. And, and I think from a council perspective, it's a, it's a really good news story in regard to uh, the reasons that this council uh, unanimously supported a $50 million pandemic response was to get the construction industry moving, which is one of the key drivers of the economy, which feeds right down to the cafes and restaurants. Um, so this is a good news story for our region um, and something that as a council we need to keep a, a close eye on because the ultimate aim and the reason we did the pandemic was to stimulate that part of the economy that may well be moving. Mm. Um, so I, I just I flagged that as a result of the question from Councillor Shine and your response. Yep. To it. I think it's, it's something that's a, a good news story and something that we should uh, have a watching brief on. Mm. And, and, and absolutely. I mean, cause and effect. Um, developers have now got a lot of lots off their books, basically. Um, there's been commitments made. Um, purchases made, what have you, so that means that they will be looking to uh, open up their next stages and we already have um, been given notice by three of our major uh, land developers that they are looking to uh, open up additional stages, two or three stages in their estates. Um, so, um, and they're, all, they're spread right across uh, urban Toowoomba and uh, so that's good. The, uh, in terms of the 25,000, it's my understanding that it's not first home buyers only, it's, it's new home builders, and uh, which is uh, a great stimulant uh, to developers, uh, to uh, development generally, uh, and, the, uh, and the provision of the housing stock across the region. Yeah, so I guess just a quick follow up, supporting that is the, the time frames to have a contract signed by the end of December, but then have um, at least something started, construction started within three months of a contract signed. So um, that in its own right will help push those things through. But just Absolutely. observation, when you hear the, the, the media and the rhetoric um, around the nation, it seems like that's well and truly bucking the trend. Mm. Yes, well, certainly, and we've continued to have uh, certainly uh, a reasonable number of new houses being built. Uh, the worry that I have personally, and uh, maybe others don't, is that our medium density or unit development is right down. Now, for example, we had uh, 57, uh, we, uh, sorry, we had 49 houses built in May, or uh, approved in May, and we only had two units. And uh, in terms of getting that balance of housing styles and types across the region, that's a bit of a concern. But we'll keep a watching brief on that. And I mean, further to your comment, Councillor MacDonald, that, um, you know, that, that land is much more affordable in our region. So, you know, you've, you've 45,000 goes much longer, further, doesn't it? So, can I have someone um, move that the report be noted by Council, Councillor uh, Carl, Councillor Antonio, all those in favour? It's carried. Now we will adjourn the meeting. Can I have someone move the adjournment? Councillor O'Shea, Councillor MacDonald. All those in favour? Carried.
meeting of Toowoomba Regional Council. This meeting is open to the public and will also be live streamed. I'd like to thank those of you who are in the room with us today and acknowledge everyone watching via Council's social media channels. I especially would like to acknowledge uh, Portfolio Lead, Councillor Nancy Summerfield, Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Antonio, Deputy Mayor MacDonald, my fellow councillors and General Manager Platts and the CEO and Wendy. Um, and thank you very much for being with us, Matt, uh, Manager of Waste. We've only got, uh, actually before that, uh, I acknowledge the Aboriginal parties whose song lines traverse these lands we meet on today, the Western Waka Waka, Guyabal and Jarawa peoples, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the rich, uh, they hold the knowledge, rich traditions and bold ambitions of Australia's first peoples. We have no uh, apologies or leave of absence to note, and there's one item on our table of contents to discuss today, that's item number three, review of the Waste Infrastructure Plan 2017. I'll hand over to Matt, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, councillors. Uh, the report before you today recommends the adoption of a revised Waste Infrastructure Plan 2020. The existing Waste Infrastructure Plan was adopted in 2017. Since that time, we have constructed three facilities under that plan, uh, being uh, uh, three Tier 5 facilities at Kuya, Evergreen and Cecil Plain, and we have one Tier 2 facility currently under construction in Clinton. Um, this review of the plan was prompted uh, partly due to the uh, repeal of the decision to go ahead with the Wairima Waste Facility upgrade, um, uh, construction and partly due to a review of our landfill airspace uh, capacity in our regional uh, landfills which um, identified significant opportunities to um, defer and reduce our capital expenditure by keeping those facilities operating for longer. The plan builds on many of the key principles of the existing waste infrastructure plan, but does introduce some new principles. Um, primarily, the, these are um, a preference to use existing waste facility sites rather than looking for fresh sites for our waste facilities, an aim to better utilise our remaining landfill space um, to defer upgrades wherever we possibly can. Uh, some facilities have been removed from the program as they are already operating as, as transfer stations effectively and providing uh, a good level of service to our community. And way bridges will be installed at a number of our sites in order to meet our levy compliance obligations. The overall impact of this revised plan is a $25.1 million reduction in our future capital um, expenditure. In summary, the revised plan will be an important document to properly inform our planning and budget decisions relating to waste infrastructure and it's recommended for adoption. Councillors, any questions? Councillor Summerfield. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Matt, congratulations on all the work that you do in the waste sector. Very impressed with um, all the great things that you're doing there. I think I've told you that often, but I think it should be on the public record. You do a really great job. And I'd just like to, I've got three questions if I could. Um, one is in relation to the designs of our tiers, one through to five, five or six. Um, and I'm just wondering, we've built some tier fives and, and acknowledging that there is great efficiency in relation to reduction of waste to landfill in that design. Is there any opportunity to review it to reduce um, costs in any way? Uh, because we do know that the tier fives have been quite expensive to build previously and just wondering and understanding that there's tender involved and all that sort of thing that is there opportunity for us to trim that design at all to save costs? That's the first one. Um, thank you, Councillor. Yes, uh, absolutely there is and that's, um, that's part of the inclusion in the um, forecast budgetary saving that we are looking at opportunities to reduce um, the size and scale of some of the facilities to better match the, the catchment and our projected uh, transaction numbers and also our projected um, um, uh, ton tonnage figures that we, we see for those facilities. So we're looking particularly in relation to the size of the buildings, um, the number of uh, vehicle spaces, the, um, the use of various technologies such as cameras, so, um, so that some of those can be very expensive. So we're just looking at reviewing all of those things, um, trying to minimise our, our roadways, where um, so pavement, pavement areas where possible, um, so all of that is being considered and um, we do see that the, the future facilities that will be constructed will, will be um, 
at a, at a lesser cost than what we have seen for some of the facilities to date because of the learnings we've had through that process. Excellent, thank you, that's good news. So in relation to um, Bowenville, where we currently have a, um, um, like a mini dipster, uh, dumpster outside on the, in, on the way into the township of Bowenville, which is quite unsightly, um, and that we do actually have a landfill just across the highway, um, which has a power pole right beside it. And um, I have uh, mentioned to you, but I just wanted the councillors to be aware about the opportunity of perhaps having um, uh, tips, uh, skip bins or whatever there um, in that area locked up so that only locals could access it and, and uh, dump waste in there. Will that be considered moving forward? Because I think at the moment, and we have tried just having wheelie bins there at the entrance to town, that didn't work, so we then introduced skip bins and that really hasn't worked either because it still overflows everywhere there. People tend to use it as the dump rather than travel to John Darien, which is the current requisite. So I'm just wondering whether there is opportunity to look at that moving forward. Um, again, yes, absolutely. We're looking at that um, currently at a, at a low cost option to have an area where we could have a number of bins that could be collected and keep that area in a tidy, um, keep it at a tidy location. Um, the reason Bowenville wasn't included in this plan is because it's not currently considered as a waste facility location um, under our existing plan and we didn't want to make any commitments under this plan that we definitely would do something. But um, we are currently looking at our options there and, and do believe something is, is achievable um, at, a, at a relatively low capital cost. There will be an ongoing operational cost obviously to service those bins as there is already. Um, the reason um, that Bowenville was left out is primarily due to the fact that it is within 20 minutes of the John Darien um, waste facility and our um, existing service level is uh, to have 98% of the population living within 20 minutes of a facility. So by putting something more formalised in Bowenville, we're actually over-servicing that part of the community. Mm -hmm. However, that is definitely something that um, we, we can do, obviously, as a council, make that decision to, to go ahead with that and um, we can... Um, once we've got some uh, different uh, concept ideas of what can be done there, we can we can return with those ideas. Wonderful, thank you. I appreciate that, Matt. So then the other thing is, um, on the last page, you talked about um, uh, potential to vary opening hours for the different facilities. Um, would that come back to councillors as a report before any changes were made, just to ensure that the, in the communities aren't impacted too, too badly? Uh, yes, we recognise that um, Opening times are uh, very much a community um, uh, interface and that's, they're included in this report, so any changes to the operating hours would, re would require a, a revision of this waste infrastructure plan and would be returned to Council. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor Summerfield. Any other questions? Uh, Councillor O'Hara Sullivan. So there, there are two significant parts to that. The first is that there are three waste facilities being Crow's Nest, Oakey and Ravensbourne that were included in the original waste infrastructure plan. Um, my review of that indicated that those facilities were all operating um, well as transfer stations. Um, the community was um, happy with the level of service they were achieving and um, then there is no need to do significant upgrades to those sites in the short term. Notwithstanding, we may do minor upgrades to those facilities to put in um, minor little small tip shops or something like that. But in terms of a large upgrade, I don't believe that it is warranted at this stage. So that's that's a, a large component of that saving. The other, the, the other component, and largely to do with the deferral of, of um, the upgrades, is to do with the, the landfill space. Um, and essentially that comes down to doing regular surveys of the existing landfills and that hadn't been done um, uh, very um, regularly in the past. So we now do annual surveys of all of our facilities so we can actually see um, how much space is being used per year. And secondly, we have also gone through a process as part of our um, rehabilitation planning 
of looking at what is the maximum size the landfill can be and still be able to be rehabilitated without having to go back and completely reshape the area. So we, we now know exactly how, my, how many cubic metres of landfill is being used per year, but we also have a very um, solid plan as to what the final profile of those landfills will be. Um, we didn't have that clear in the past. So given that information, we're able to much more accurately reflect the, the future life of those facilities. Councillor O'Shea. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Question and a comment, I guess, Matt. First of all, um, yeah, congratulations on it. I think it's a, it's a great piece of work. I, I was quite encouraged reading through the report around the community expectations. Like We talked about those targets of 98% being within 20 minutes. And say when we first rolled this out, there was some resistance or maybe not an understanding of what that process was. So to see through the customer survey indicating the, you know, those, those numbers, what, 79 in, in 2007, 81% in, in 2019. So do you see that as something that the the, the journey that we're on here, where, where our community is with, with this actual process, uh, is there still more work to be done or are we completely comfortable that that the community, whilst there was some resistance to start with, has and, and a great job through obviously the communication we've done with this is, has has come on board and it's and, and it's working quite well to meet those expectations because I, I guess I draw that around the fact of remember the amount of people at different times why was this here and what did this cost there and and, and all of the rest of it because um, you know that was a, a lot early. Yeah. So in terms of communication, there's there's kind of three. Um, areas where we've had um, a lot of communication with our community. One was around the Wairema facility. So we, we got a, a, a really good understanding of community expectations, particularly to the south of Toowoomba, but I think um, largely an understanding of what the community wants to see um, from a lot of the feedback around letters and social media around that. So we understood that. We secondly got a lot of feedback when we looked at um, changing of opening hours. So we got a lot of um, a much better understanding of the community's expectations around that. And obviously the community survey has helped there as well. In addition, Waste Services has done additional waste audits and included in those audits have been surveys. So we have surveyed um, portions of the population, both in our curbside pickup areas, but also when people visit the waste facility. And we've collected information on those. Um, and, and while they are relatively small numbers of people, um, relative to the population, they do give um, very consistent feedback around what the community's ex expectations are with regard to facilities. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't foresee that we'll be needing to do a great deal of communication around this, this piece of work, and I don't foresee there'll be a huge change to this when we look to review the plan again in another three years' time, but certainly that may, may be the case depending on any feedback we get in the meantime. So I guess finally, so yeah, kudos to yourself and the team, a great example of, of understanding community expectation and, and, and delivering to that. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor O'Shea. Councillor Carl. Yeah, through you, Chair. Um, Matt, um, I take, take it the uh, new strategy is um, applied the principles of whole-of-life costs um, in, in uh, given the business is more a logistics business than a waste business. And by that I mean we don't have the volumes, but we have a lot of distance, uh, which is the expensive part of our waste management in this region. <coughs> um, in revamping this strategy, has there been those whole of life costs around logistics um, in the way we, um, as I recall, we were originally going to look at a uh, technique of dealing with waste on site and it, uh, we soon established the fact that we were going to save many millions of dollars over many years. Um, so that's when we say we are revising and look at in, looking at cu cutting costs, I appreciate that, but at what cost does it come cutting initial capital investment? I mean, because oftentimes capital investment's the cheapest part of the bargain. Um, and I just wonder if we, uh, when it comes to economies of scale, if we build a number of hooky cutter facilities um, up front uh, and you equate that out over the whole of life, 
um, I'm just wondering if we cut cl too close to the bone and then we end up spending tomorrow's dollar rate in the first place. I guess there's a few questions there and it's, and it's going along the lines of Councillor Megan's question there about the differences and I do understand that there would be big differences uh, or savings gained once we understand our profiling and capacity on landfilling and our, any advances we've made on compaction and all those sorts of things, um, there would be some savings there. But the other stuff, I'm uh, cautious that we might be or could be underdoing for the sake of a few dollars now when it could sting us in the tail down the track. So in relation to the whole of life costing, this, this plan does uh, incorporate that and that was one of the key principles of the old uh, waste infrastructure plan and that has been carried through. The, um, the saving you're referring to relates to the use of a uh, roll-on, roll-off bin versus a side tipper um, in, in, in the logistics side of the, the business. Um, while facilities are operating as landfills, we're not doing either. So there's actually a very significant saving by leaving sites as landfills. The saving between a side tipper and a roll-on, roll-off bin comes in once it's transferred over to a transfer station. So that's when we actually start having those transport costs. So by actually deferring the upgrades from landfills to transfer stations, we're not, we are um, very significantly reducing our operational costs as well. So as we, as we change facilities to transfer stations, we will, re we will um, have, more, have a greater operational cost due to the transport. And it is very important, and I agree, um, that we need to be looking at the best transport methods when that comes in. And um, that still is um, considered to be a side tipper, which is the way we've gone in the past. So that's definitely considered and um, uh, understand your, your concern, but it's definitely been incorporated into this plan. So um, we are looking at the whole of life cost and this plan not only reduces our capital spend, but it actually does reduce our operational spend as well. Um, in relation to building uh, a number of facilities at a time as a package, yes, that's definitely been considered in the past, um, looking at partnering with certain contractors. We have looked at that and we did look at that for some of our most recent facilities as well and there are definitely pros and cons to that approach. Um, and um, from, from the information we've seen in recent tenders, we don't see that there's a, a great financial advantage in doing so. Um, and in some cases it can lock us into a particular contractor for many years um, without actually seeing the financial advantage there. So um, while, while we will never know that for sure, um, I don't consider it to be a, a significant issue. But just one additional one, if I may, Madam Chair, um, with regards to landfill, um, I, I note you say that we we don't need to have those operational costs at the moment, but that's what I'm worried about down the track as regulation changes in this country, and it will, um, and I'd bet my last dollar on that one, um, the, the, as regulation and legislation changes around that, I'm just wondering, the more we allow to go to landfill rather than treat our business as a logistics business and, and, and deal with the waste streams differently, yes, we have the disadvantage of low volume, but I'm just wondering whether in 10, 20 years down the track we've paid on the other end because we've allowed uh, land fills to continue um, when we could have intervened earlier. So we'll obviously look at different technologies as they are introduced and if there's an opportunity to um, have a better financial um, outcome then we could look at um, changing these facilities to, to transfer stations earlier if that was the, be the best financial outcome for Council. Even under this plan, we're still looking to um, transition all of our landfills to transfer stations over the next 11, 12 years. So, it's, so we are looking to get out of our landfill um, business apart from our main landfill in Toowoomba. Um, that, that hasn't changed, it's just a factor of doing that over a, a longer time frame to defer that, that capital expenditure. Um, in terms of the regulatory frameworks, um, those facilities in our regional areas are at the lower end of the scale. Most of those are licensed to accept um, between one and 5,000 tonnes of waste a year, which is very much on the low side. And um, certainly in discussions with uh, the Department of Environment and Science, they're not looking to make any changes to that end of the, 
of the spectrum. Certainly there might be greater levels of compliance in the, in the large landfills and we may see that at our Toowoomba Waste Management Centre. But certainly for the next 10 to 15 years, I don't foresee any issues operating those smaller landfills. Does that answer your question, Councillor Carl? Yeah, sort of. I, j I just think uh, of just having two two different countries and looked at where they were 20 years ago and what they're paying for now, um, I see potential repetitive cycle of uh, costs imposed. Um, and I draw on Brisbane as our closest neighbour for making some what I would consider decisions they would regret now uh, and are paying dearly. And it's not just with landfill, it's around buffering, around uh, critical infrastructure, a whole range of things. But landfill, whilst it's low tonnage now, with increased legislation and regulation around that, it mightn't be for 10 years, but after that there may be some, in, and we do know what the decommissioning costs are now, let alone 10, 15 years in, in, into the future. So that's where, why we think we might save some money on the front end, um, it's always dearer with uh, indexing on the back end where we really pay uh, big time um, for possibly some, yes, albeit expensive in today's dollars, intervention spending, um, it's cheap over the long run. I, I, I just have some reserves. Um, I, mm. Matt, I, I, I trust in uh, staff's capabilities and, 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 and their technical expertise from a long-term view, I just I, had, I do have some reserves that we we just need to be on the lookout for those potential uh, implications. Thanks, Councillor Carl. Councillor McMahon. Well, I had a question earlier, Chair. It's mostly been answered, but Matt, I was just wondering about um, the uh, the future of Yarram and Green Mountain Mill Merrin that are at capacity. What what the plans are uh, in those particular instances? So all three of those facilities, there's money in this year's capital budget to do detailed design, um, D, DA or any, any approvals that are required and essentially get them to ready for uh, tender. Um, so the intention would be that we would put forward um, capital um, submissions to have those three facilities built um, in, over the next two financial years. They would be um, smaller versions of what you see at uh, Greater Toowoomba Waste Management Facility. And, and follow up, Chair, if I may, just regarding rehab, is there, you know, future sports fields or something in the in the pipeline for those facilities? Or so we're we're looking at those. Um, we do have a final program now of when those facilities will be upgraded. There's limited opportunities there, mainly because most of these facilities are <coughs> in very remote areas. They they don't have good infrastructure around in terms of power and water and those type of things. But but certainly, as, as we go through the process, we'll look at any opportunities that do come up. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor McMahon. Councillor MacDonald. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, through you to, you to Matt, um, just one of the bigger changes, I guess, that's come through since 2017 is the State Government uh, initiative as well in regard to the waste reduction and recycling and waste levy. I'm just wondering in regard to the mandated way bridge for each of the sites, whether uh, we could expect some um, revenue or some income coming from the state waste levy to support the introduction of those. We did see when the first round of the Waybridge legislation came in that the state put forward funding to, to co-fund those Waybridges. The next lot of uh, sites that require Waybridges come in uh, for us in, in 2024. So if we were to see funding from the state, we'd probably see that around the 2023. Um, the state has indicated that they would um, be supportive to ensure that councils can afford to implement the levy compliance measures, but it'll be a couple of years until we would see that money. Thanks, Matt. Just a, another question, completely off topic, probably on topic, sideways, shift. Um, just in regard to um, the landfill sites, is there still, given the the state government's uh, diversion rates and targets, and, and you might, um, may, maybe it's a question on notice in regard to what our current diversion rates are, but um, as I understand it, we're well and truly above what the targets are. Um, will the landfill um, sites still enable that diversion rate as well for a, 
for a person just going to use the landfill site, can they have that facility as well? So there's a few parts to that question. Um, our, our current diversion rate across the board is around 30 to 35 per cent, um, and that's largely driven by our curbside um, collection. So our curbside achieves around the 25 to 30 per cent diversion rate, um, and that is by far the largest proportion of our waste stream. We do see up to a 70 per cent diversion rate at Greater Toowoomba Waste Management Facility. As we implement new facilities, we would expect to see similar. Um, a large reason that um, it's difficult to measure at the moment is because we don't have weighbridges at these sites, so we use deeming tables that the state government mandates are used um, as a consistent way of, of measuring. Um, as, we in, as, as we either transfer, transition over to transfer stations or install weighbridges, I expect that we'll see a very significant shift and our, our diversion rates will definitely increase because we'll be measuring things properly. Um, but in terms of the existing landfills, um, as I mentioned previously, even though we might not be doing full upgrades of these sites um, in the short term, there are definitely opportunities to spend small amounts of money to increase our di diversion options at facilities. We've already, at almost all of our facilities now, we now have an e-waste collection. We're gonna look at um, opportunities for mattresses and, and other, other materials. So while they're all small incremental improvements, they will overall help um, with increasing that overall diversion that we have. So just to, just to follow up, I mean, that's outstanding and I guess it hits to the core of Councillor Carl's questioning around the spend now and the spend later, um, but I'm encouraged by just the rhetoric in, in the conversation there in regard to things that we are changing and we are adapting um, and moving with not only legislation but actually leading in some of those areas as well. In regard to the curbside collection, um, it's my understanding that that is continuing to be expanded. So would that then uh, assist with the landfill um, growth or, or the size of landfill in those areas? One would assume it would. That's right. So as, as we expand our collection areas, as, as we do that, we'll be using our regional landfills less because the residents in those areas won't go to those regional landfills. And um, in almost all cases, the, the waste collected in our curbside collection trucks comes back to Toowoomba, with the exception of Milmerran. So um, obviously as we expand that service, we'll be using our main landfill in Toowoomba more and our landfills in the regional areas will be used less. Final one, <laughs> Madam, mm -hmm. Madam Chair. And uh, it it's, um, probably reaffirms Councillor Summerfield's comments in regard to the tears and Kuya just comes to mind uh, in regard to you know, you're working on the, the 20 minute 98% of coverage of people and um, for that site, uh, to cover that area. Um, that's why I'm encouraged with this report, Matt. I think you've done an outstanding job and, uh, and I'd, I'm more than happy to support what you've done. Thanks, Councillor MacDonald. Uh, Councillor O'Hara Sullivan. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is um, on the topic, but maybe a bit of a side topic. Is, um, how much do we, um, and do we, in terms of um, doing part of the research and development So Toowoomba obviously is involved in, in all of those um, activities. We are largely involved through LGAQ. Um, that's, that's the primary method in which we engage with, our, with the, the um, broader discussions around recycling. But we are also um, part of reference groups through um, the Department of Environment and Science and, and other government departments. Um, Obviously, it's very much an industry-led um, uh, industry initiatives, anything to do with recycling. So we're, we're part of the chain, but there's also obviously the people who manufacture the materials to start with. Um, <coughs> there's the, the collectors, the recyclers, um, and we're, we're really at this point, we're only one part of the chain. Something we would be very interested in looking at more is having a, a local um, material recovery facility, so something somewhere where we could actually sort our recycling locally and then that provides opportunities to then reuse that material locally. Um, as we investigate that, that would drive us to be um, much more involved in that recycling industry. Currently, all of our recycling is simply sent to Brisbane and it's processed down there, so we, we, we are at arm's length, although we do um, have regular discussions around that. Involved. 
Yeah, so we're, we're kind of the middle point because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of work that needs to happen at the front end, particularly around the packaging. Um, I mentioned to uh, Councillor Jeff earlier, a very good example of that is a packet of Pringles um, where we have cardboard on the outside, foil on the inside and a plastic lid. Um, so in order to recycle that, the materials actually have to be stripped apart from each other. It's not practical at all. Um, and so they're the types of real initiatives that need to be worked on um, at, the, at the packaging end. Council obviously is the collector at the moment. We potentially be, could become a processor doing the stripping and sorting and then there's the final use of the product. So um, local government probably could play a bigger role in that as we move forward, but at the moment we're, we're kind of in the middle of that process. Thanks, um, Councillor O'Hara Sullivan. And I guess that raises questions about community expectations that we have visibility of what happens with our waste as well. And is it good enough for us to be at arm's length? Those are all things that we'll have to consider. Councillor Carl. Oh, just to comment, Madam Chair, along product, product stewardship. Um, you know, it would be great if uh, federal government of any persuasion would actually stand up and mandate and legislate around some product stewardship. It would give everyone else in the waste stream and the waste cycle some clear and definite direction around how we deal with our waste. Uh, after all, we're all generators of waste. Mm. That's not going away, the issue. And it would give local governments uh, much more certainty on how to invest their dollars into a waste management strategy. I'm not, I'm not as buoyed by the 25 to 30 per cent average of um, recycling that we're gaining at the moment, but we, you know, that's there's room for improvement, um, and that's why I raised my concerns. Um, initially about uh, the, the potential legacy we leave um, for the sake of spending some intervention dollars now. And it's along the lines of that questioning, but we're not actually assisted by some clear and um, long-term legislation that supports that. But if that does happen, well, then there would be some changes, no doubt. Thanks, Councillor Carl. Councillor Taylor? Thank you, Madam Chair, and I agree with Councillor Carl's comments. Uh, we, um, yes, and community expectation is such, then we have to all start thinking about where we, how we're recycling and what we can do with it, but it, it has to be practical too, because it is our ratepayers' money. But at the end of the day, I think Councillor Carl's hit on a really good suggestion there, and I think that we should take it through to LGAQ, that there should be some kind of mandating, because even buying clothes, you get a paper bag but then you have rope handles and, and different things on it, you know, that you, I take the time to cut those out. But it, it should be easy for people to recycle. It should be, you know, it should be simple that you... This goes... I didn't realise about the Pringles because I do put them in the general waste bin, not that I eat them very often. But, I mean, everywhere you go, you've got this complexity. I mean, people have got the feel-good factor by giving you paper bags, but unless they've actually got... Uh, one company puts perforated lines around the handles so you can pull the ribbon handle out but most of them have got rope handles which it's just a small thing I only mention it because there has to be some leadership from perhaps somewhere someone federally to uh, point those things out because I think you know with the best of intention they haven't completely done the job right and uh, we can't be picking up that slack in our area but if if everyone's working towards the common goal of more recycling, less general waste, less to what landfill. And I think the companies need to have a responsibility. So Councillor Carl's suggestion is a very good one and I suggest that we should push that up through LGAQ and perhaps there's an idea for us to put something to the annual conference which is open for uh, uh, motions at this point of time. So I think that, uh, you know, we should be thinking of the bigger picture there because making recycling as easy as it can be for the children, for everybody in concerned, is just a no-brainer, really. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Any... Uh, Councillor uh, Antonio. I just wouldn't mind reflecting in a very positive fashion on, uh, on what's happening. And, Matt, thanks very much to you and the whole team, Amy, and the whole, the whole team for what you've done. Uh, I think the progress that we've made over the last year, when I look back at my very early days in local government, where there was a, every small community in the area where I lived, Big bulldozer would come in, they'd dig out a hole, put your rubbish in, 
uh, the community would gather and go back and burn the rubbish and have a few beers and catch up. Totally different days. But uh, I think the work that's been done, the amount that we're recycling is, is really, really positive. Just want to reflect, I just want to reflect on some comments that I'm picking up when I go uh, down to Brisbane for some various meetings that I go to. I think there's the potential for a um, waste to energy facility somewhere. I know that the current position of the state government is they're particularly concerned about where they're likely, where the most popular place is for it. And a couple of ministers have uh, very gently and uh, anonymously said to me, uh, you know, what about up your way? What about the places like uh, the supercritical technology that's engaged at the Mormaran power station? Of course, it won't burn the rubbish, apparently. They've got to build a new burner. Hold. But, you know, there is potential uh, in the future. I think we're doing it well. I think what you've got given us today is, is excellent. And, uh, you know, it, it provides a pathway for the future. I'm not going to be negative about it in any way. I think it's, we ought to be very positive in terms of what we've done uh, since we built Omara's Road and, and the way we're going about it now. So thank you very much to Damien, to, to Matt and to everybody in concern. Anything else from anybody? Um, I would just reiterate um, the Mayor's comments. I think that this is terrific work that you've done here, Matt and Damien. Thank you so much. And it shows some lateral thinking, which is fantastic. Um, I have one question. The um, projected capital savings through the adoption of this um, 2020 waste infrastructure plan of 25.1 million, what happens with that? Um, well, it goes, uh, Council only sets a one-year budget at any point in time. Uh, the 10-year capital program is something that's used for pricing and for uh, indications as to where tariffs need to go. Um, uh, it would go through the... Or none of that money in the future years has been allocated. It is in the 10-year program. It would go through the natural, normal process of the prioritisation model. Uh, and in that process has uh, appropriate steps for council decisions, et cetera, uh, and... Okay, thank you. Um, and I'll just end then, if there's no other questions, by saying that we know from our community consultation surveys that waste is something that people feel really, um, you know, they, they're very pleased with the service that we provide. So just kudos to you guys, basically. It's fantastic. Um, so, we've had all the questions, nothing further, so then the recommendation is before you councillors. Um, do I have a mover? A councillor McDonald. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Summerfield. All those in favour? Carried without dissent. Thank you very much. We'll conclude the Waste and Water Committee meeting. The infrastructure meeting of Toowoomba Regional Council for July. Uh, the meeting is open to the public and, uh, and is also live streamed. I'd like to recognise our portfolio leader, Councillor Melissa Taylor, and I'd like to welcome and thank the Mayor, Councillors, General Managers and the staff teams that are here with us in the room. Uh, I acknowledge the Aboriginal parties whose song lines traverse these lands we meet on today, the Western Waka Waka, the Gaibal, the Jadawa people, and the Bigambul people who are to our west, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, for they hold the knowledge, rich traditions and bold ambitions of Australia's first peoples. I'd like to also welcome anybody who's watching us on live stream and I hope you're keeping warm. Um, we have everyone in attendance today, 
and uh, there are no apologies or leaves of absence. Uh, we move to item three, which is the request to name unnamed road, uh, 4,738 Charlton. And I'd like to recognise our General Manager, Mike Brady, and our Manager of Transport and Drainage Planning with us here today. And I'd ask Mike to uh, present this, this item. Thank you. Uh, good morning, councillors. Um, thank you, Chair. The first report we have today is to um, put a name to the, the short piece of road that we've constructed on uh, just off the uh, Nass Road as the entry into not only our new depot but the um, TMR's breakdown area and also giving access to other property there as well. Um, shortly after constructing the road we were approached by Mrs Sue Williams um, who subsequently sent a letter through to Council uh, asking um, or requesting that the naming of that section of road be uh, considered and uh, obviously put forward um, her um, suggestion. Uh, that was further taken through our normal process uh, and our policy um, for the naming of uh, council assets. Uh, with respect to that, I do have that delegation to, uh, under council's delegations, to uh, accept a name. But I thought, you know, as I've said to council when we've discussed that policy in the past, if there was something uh, a bit contentious with a name or something uh, of, um, I think, of this nature, which is actually uh, an access road to council property, I thought it was more appropriate that I bring it forward to council and allow Council the opportunity to uh, obviously have the, uh, the final call on, on that naming. Um, look, the, the name that's been put forward I think is uh, well founded in regards to some of the history behind it as per the attachment. Um, uh, we always talk to the, uh, through our local uh, history people to try to look at uh, other options as well and then there's always uh, a level of uh, local consultation in regards to naming of a of a road. Um, so I'd put the recommendation there. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mike. Any questions, comments, Councillor Sharn? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I note from the information supplied that uh, the, uh, the applicant's family uh, arrived there in 1939, but there was a family called Seba mm. in 1964. And I was just wondering. Uh, you know, in terms of the policy to which you referred, uh, is preference given to the earlier European settlers as opposed to subsequent arrivals? Uh, no, it's not a requirement that one's got to be earlier than the other or, or that sort of thing. It, it's just really uh, um, what are names that Council think are reasonable. Um, the policy which is attached to the report there sort of goes through uh, the requirements. Um, it indicates what must not be part of that naming, um, but also indicates what uh, other elements are, are considered. So the timing of what's appropriate, I mean, in essence, there's nothing stopping us just calling it Daffodil Street or something like that. Um, we, we, we're not obliged to um, call it a name. It tends to be what we do, uh, particularly around the region we do try to pick up on the historical elements of our region, um, the rich, rich traditions, so to speak, and recognise those in the, uh, in the naming. Um, obviously, a lot of naming for new subdivisions, that, that gets handled uh, through the subdivision um, DA and operational works uh, approvals approach. So that doesn't come through this, but again, they, they've got to take in note council's uh, naming policy believe in those things, those items. I suppose, uh, you know, <coughs> the name Seba was, was, has been referred to in your report. Yep. Um, so it's been considered. I'm just wondering what, what, what determined your selection of the other name as opposed to Seba in this instance? I think we've probably got a situation where we've got two worthy names here, but I, I guess maybe, Mike, is it because the land that we've taken there was... Perhaps that land, I think. Yeah, look, uh, our, uh, our consultation on, on a naming of road tends to be fairly focused around that section of road. Okay, so this is a very short little cul-de-sac, basically. Um, so it's only 
we're on one side of it. Mm. There's a service station on the other side of it, and across the road is um, the owners uh, that have put forward some of these the suggestions. So um, the tendency to call it another name uh, it's, uh, would probably be um, it's sort of not supported by the immediate owners, uh, other than council may wish to 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 head that direction if it so wish. Um, there's no reasoning why it couldn't be called Cibo Road. That that fits the policy as well. Um, that said, I suppose the the request for the name has come from uh, the people that, as per attachment one, Mrs. Sue Williams there. Um, she's given a fair bit of reasonable history. Um, uh, I, yeah, and that. No, I suppose that's why I wanted to bring it forward. And the Seba family have got a great uh, long history in the area, but um, you know, I guess that because of the land uh, proximity, I, I su suggest that's possibly why. And the, and the approach has been made. Any other comments, councillors? Mr. Mayor, did you want to make a comment? I thought you had your hand up there. <coughs> I was quite happy to move the record. Okay. Um, thank you. Oh, sorry, Councillor Carr. And second. Um, is, w who's m moving? Oh, th thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moved the Mayor and seconded Councillor Carl. Any comment, councillors? Any other comment? I think we're very fortunate to actually have had the two names submitted and perhaps at some stage in the future there might be something that comes up for the Sebra family. So I think it's wonderful to recognise, as Mike has mentioned, our, our rich traditions and uh, by doing this, even though it's a small road, it'll be noticed because there's a lot of people using the depot. So. Um, we have a mover and a seconder for that motion. Uh, the all in favour? It's carried, thank you. So now we, uh, we move into a closed session. Can I? Uh, can I just uh, <coughs> seek yes, Mr. Mayor. your permission just to yes. things as a result of our uh, meeting in Brisbane on last Friday? Yes. <coughs> and I've had this discussion with you, I've had it with Mike, I've had it with Council Melissa, in respect to some technology that's being used uh, by the Moreton Bay Regional mm. Council. Yeah. Uh, they're equipping their, their uh, garbage trucks, waste trucks, whatever you want to call them, with technology that identifies road problems and reports those road problems immediately. Mm. Now, I would think that we're at the stage where it'd be good if we could get a briefing on that. We were to have a briefing on Friday in, in Brisbane, and whether it was technology or what was going wrong, we didn't get that briefing. But the uh, Moreton Bay Regional Council are very advanced there. I'm more than happy to come involved with the CEO's office to make sure we get that briefing Yeah, I think it would be interesting for us to see that technology and to see if we can use it to our advantage. And I'm aware of it. I, I have, when I, when I went to Taiwan uh, last year, uh, it was discussed over there. Um, I think it would be great for us to have a, a presentation here if we could. And uh, it, uh, I'm sure that the CEO and Mike would probably uh, work through that. So thank you very much for bringing that. I didn't think about it, to be honest, but it would, if we understand it a little bit better, then we can, un we can make, you know, make some, a strategy around it. I think it's worth it, mm. background knowledge for all of us to have, and uh, it's out there, that technology's there, and if it can save us money. Mm. And, of, and of course, unlike Moreton Bay, every, the garbage collection doesn't go everywhere, but that's all right, it'd pick up quite a lot of it. A massive area? Absolutely. No, yeah. we may have other vehicles we can put that technology on mm. covering the roads. Uh, yeah, no, it's really, things are moving fairly quickly in that space. Councillor Carr? Yeah, Madam Chair, additionally too, um, at the, the last term we were, Councillor Nancy will be aware of this, um, there's the opportunity to um, look across business units in council and some of that, mm. uh, the waste collection trucks around smart metering and the reading of metres in the yeah. metered areas as well. So there's a, there's a, yeah. Mm. And, and even the... ...of that. Mm. You know, this is but a, a yeah. technology that's available. And, and we did have at the last council, I think, a presentation of bins that tell you when they're full or how much is in them and all the rest of it as well. So yep. you might make a comment, Mark? Yeah, just so council know, at an office level, we've sort of been aware of the trialling that uh, Morton Bay's been doing and um, through IPWAQ and that oh, yes. um, there's been a little bit of information coming through from time to time. So we've been watching it as it's evolved over the last couple of years there. Um, internally, we've also had discussions with waste, uh, our waste team here, um, sort of 
with the development of the new waste contracts and stuff like that, how we um, uh, bring these sort of initiatives in there mm -hmm. into those sorts of contracts so that um, if uh, the contractor uh, has to fit fit this to their trucks, how, how that is um, mm -hmm. actually sort of paid for, so as to speak, under any sort of contractual arrangements and things like that. So, and obviously the, the key of those contracts are obviously is to pick up waste. Um, so it's, uh, discussions are happening, so, but i uh, be more than happy to bring a, mm. a, a briefing information session forward to, to council in, in due course. And that's uh, rather exciting, you know, and having been over in Taiwan, the mayor talks about a a waste facility, we've seen uh, plastics to to biofuels and all sorts of things. So we've just got to take, I suppose, try to keep ourselves in in touch and try to take out of it what works for us. So uh, thank you very much, Mike. And thank you, Mr Mayor, for bringing that forward. And Brian, you, thanks the team, will work on that. So I think it is a trial, isn't it, uh, down at Moreton Bay? So. Well, the start of this trial, yeah. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where it's at at the moment, yeah. but we'll find all that out when they come up. So we have... Um, we, I need to have a um, motion to go into closed session, please. Councillor MacDonald, Councillor O'Hara Sullivan. Those in favour? It's carried, thank you. Uh, I have... Um
question, please? To uh, not that we not accept. That council not accept. Oh, okay. Sorry, redo Wendy. We need to redo those two declarations before we vote on this matter. Thanks, Councillor Macdonald. No, no. You. Well, the mayor would have to as well. Do we need to bring them back in? Just reopen them. Yeah. So well, they haven't returned. Okay, Councillor Macdonald, Councillor Melissa. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, pursuant to Section 175E of the Local Government Act 2009. On the meeting that I have a personal interest in this matter, which may be a real or perceived conflict of interest, the particulars of which are as follows. The nature of the interest is I own, own, own property situated at 435 Ruthven Street and 2 Club Lane, Toowoomba. I request that it be minuted that I declared a conflict of interest in relation to item one, permit parking to permit style parking options at the infrastructure committee meeting on 10 September 2019 and the councils determined that I did not have either a real conflict of interest or perceived conflict of interest. As the relevant circumstances have not changed since the council's determination that I do not have either a real conflict of interest or perceived conflict of interest, I'm free to participate in the meeting whilst the matter is discussed, including voting on the matter. Thank you, Councillor Macdonald. Councillor Melissa. Um, pursuant to section 175E of the Local Government Act 2009, I would like to inform the meeting that I have a personal interest in this matter, which I recognise may be a real or perceived conflict of interest, the particulars of which are as follows. The nature of the interest is my sister Christine Taylor, a hairdresser at seat, Suite 6 Hair by Christine in the old Chronicle Arcade, pays for a car park in Chronicle Lane in the Toowoomba CBD. I have determined that this personal interest is not of sufficient significance that it will lead me to making a decision on this matter. It is contrary to the public interest. I will best perform my responsibility by serving the overall public interest of the whole of the council area by participating in the discussion and voting on this matter. However, I acknowledge that the remaining councillors must now determine, pursuant to section 175E4 of the Local Government Act 2009, whether I have a real conflict of interest in this matter or a perceived conflict of interest in this matter. And if so, whether I must leave the meeting while this matter is discussed or voted on, or I may participate in the meeting in relation to the matter, including by voting on the matter. Thank you, Councillor Melissa Taylor. Um, just for clarity, Council did decide, but that was actually in closed meeting. So that decision was made that Council believed that you didn't have a conflict of interest and you could remain in the meeting, just for clarity, in the public meeting. Thank you. So I'll hand over now to... Uh, do we have a mover for that, that Council does not um, item... Um, five, that, thank you Councillor Macdonald, the mm -hmm. Council will not accept any of the tenders received for the allocation of guaranteed parking for the Toowoomba bus station car park. Seconder, Councillor Melissa Taylor, any, well there's no debate because it was a closed session. Those in favour? It's carried, thank you. We move on to item six. Thank you, Mike. We'll, we'll have declarations with this one as well. And and possibly Mayor as well. Might yes. Yes, Mayor's not here so, at the moment, so if... He really should come back in, yes. We need to go through it all again. You'll know it off by heart by that time, but it's that's what we need to do. Uh, can somebody see if the Mayor's in the in the close close vicinity? Went here. Moved, yes, yes. So we need to move a motion for that as well. Councillors, whilst we're waiting for that, I think it might be appropriate that we have a mover and a seconder and, and by resolution we decide, we um, we have that decision that we've that this item has been moved from a closed session to an open session. Can I have someone move that please? Councillor Carl, Councillor Vonhoff, Moved Councillor Carl, second to Councillor Vonhoff. Those in favour? It's carried, thank you. That's saying that we've moved it from the closed to discuss in an open session. Thank you. He's got not there. Okay, thank you. If you wanted to... And maybe perhaps you could start yours, Councillor MacDonald. Yeah, I'm not down here to list to do this, but I probably should be, I would say. Um, yeah. No, no, you're not actually, but yes. Yeah. Pursuant to section 175E of the Local Government Act 2009, I'd like to inform the meeting that I have a personal interest in the matter 
uh, which I recognise may be a real or perceived conflict of interest, the particulars which are as follows. The nature of the interest is I own property situated at 435 Ruthven Street, Toowoomba and 2 Club Lane, Toowoomba. I request that it be minuted that I declare a conflict of interest in relation to item 1, permit style parking options at the Infrastructure Committee meeting on 10 September 2019 and the Council has determined that I did not have a, either a real conflict of interest or perceived conflict of interest. As the relevant circumstances have not changed since, uh, my deter since the Council's determination that I did not have either a real conflict of interest or perceived conflict of interest, I'm free to participate in the meeting whilst the matter is discussed, including voting on the matter. Thank you, Councillor MacDonald. Councillor Melissa Taylor. Pursuant to section 175E of the Local Government Act 2009, I would like to inform the meeting that I have a personal interest in this matter, which I recognise may be a real or perceived conflict of interest, the particulars of which are as follows. The nature of the interest is my sister Christine Taylor, a hairdresser at Suite 6 Hair by Christine in the old Chronicle Arcade, pays for a car park in Chronicle Lane in the Toowoomba CBD. I have determined that this personal interest is not of sufficient significance that will lead me to making a decision on this matter that is contrary to the public interest. I will best perform my responsibility of serving the overall public interest of the whole of the Council's area by participating in the discussion and voting on this matter. Thank should do, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ta Melissa Taylor. And we have determined that uh, you have no conflict of interest. So thank you. Is the Mayor coming? Uh, no? It's been co contacted. Okay. So what do we do? Um, just mention. So we'll wait. If, you, if and when he returns, he'll make a declaration. So we'll move into the body of the report. And I'd ask Mike and Rodney to present that. Thank you. Item six. Um, sorry. So, Mr Mayor, we're just discussing whether you really do have a conflict of interest here or not. And the... Yeah, and are in view of my experience in this, in this chamber. Oh, well, that's your decision, Mr Mayor. Thank you. Do you want to make a declaration? Sorry, that's what we've called you in for. Next item. Yes, thank you. Six. Last time I won't repeat myself. Okay. Exactly the same. It's because my niece has a... Uh, married to a man who's a director of that company, and I, I'm sorry, but I will not take the risk. Okay, thank you, Mr Mayor. So, we, thank you for coming right, back. Same, Thank you. Yeah, do, he doesn't know. Okay, now I'd ask um, Mr Brady to re present the item. Thank you. Uh, Councillors, uh, thank you for that. Take a breath while that all happens. Mm. Um, now further to uh, item five that we've just discussed, uh, councillors are not accepting any tenders. Um, obviously, a fair bit of work has gone into looking at other options um, to, to still implement a uh, solution for long-term parking at the Toowoomba bus station car park. Um, the report presents that and presents a number of options and looks at some of the pros and cons uh, with that uh, through through the report. Um, there's in the report, um, the report sort of looks at a what you might call a sort of a, a couple of options. One based around a, looking at the car park from a premium parking perspective, so pricing uh, in accordance with that. Another option is to look at the pricing it to balance other demands across other car parks. Um, both have their place when you look at the uh, our, our strategy, our car parking strategy that Council uh, approved back in uh, December last year, in 2019, which is also attached to the report and possibly uh, you may have been able to have a little bit of a look at that. Um, the report then goes on and illustrates uh, what um, setting of the price could be and there's a table which really does do a fairly um, detailed comparison of cost recovery analysis of uh, the different options the Council may wish to consider. And those that were noted at the briefing session have been looked at um, in a little bit of detail within that table and that table is on page 9 of 10 of the report. Um, we also looked at that, uh, those options against a number of different models of how much parking you actually might uh, initially at least um, authorise as long-term car, car parking spots. So the, a bit of work has been done in that comparison as well. 
the recommendation, the officer's recommendation, council is is to um, really go probably with the uh, towards more of a premium um, parking um, cost, and this is so to uh, approach um, so as to mitigate um, the <coughs> loss of uh, the net loss of co um, revenue or potential revenue to council. Um, as a has been pointed out in the in the report, there is a cost to implement any form of regulated type of um, long-term parking. Um, there's infrastructure to put in, and then there's the management of that space. So that's an ongoing cost. So there's the upfront capital cost in year one, and then the ongoing annual cost to to manage that, and um, that needs to be taken into account when comparing uh, all the options. Um, I might uh, reference that table again uh, on page nine of the report, councillors. That really does show the potential um, differentiations between the options when you look at the uh, the dollars involved. Um, if you know, from a point of view of the do nothing option being fully occupied at the top deck, um, not that that happens terribly often, but that would equate on a on an annual comparison. Uh, as the best option um, for council, uh, generally because we're not actually putting any infrastructure in or uh, adding to the ongoing operational and management costs of the Toowoomba bus station car park. There's other options indicated there, even a partial outcome of uh, a do nothing, uh, 90 spaces out of 160 uh, is still quite a reasonable uh, average uh, that has been achieved pre-COVID, uh, grant you that, um, on on the car parking um, at the uh, at the bus station. Uh, the options one to five then obviously go into a little bit of detail of uh, what the costs would be uh, going forward. And yes, there could be um, you know net costs from year two on. Um, that would equal or better what we possibly get now uh, on top of the deck, uh, top deck of the car park. But that, uh, but it would take at least three years, um, two to three years, to actually get your money back from the upfront um, capital investment. So this moving into this arrangement, um, council would need to be looking at. To, from a break-even point of view, to be at least looking at sort of a, well, I'd be suggesting the best part of a three-year arrangement that we'd be heading down the track of, and then for it to actually be seen to potentially um, be making uh, more than we make currently, um, it would probably take a number of years beyond that, uh, pending how car parking post-COVID uh, across the city is taken up. Um, and obviously, depending on the option council wishes to take forward. That said, compared to the do nothing option, um, as you can see, if it was full uh, all the time, um, you know, that's obviously the best economic option for council. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Councillors? Open to suggestions. Thank you. Um, I think that there's some tables in the, um, in the previous item that haven't been carried over into this one, and that's... Um, uh, where you see that it was almost fully occupied for most of October, for November and December. And I say again that that was school pre presentations and big events they had at the Empire. So um, uh, they, it, it, it is used in, during those things because there isn't enough parking anywhere else. So, councillors, over to you. Madam Chair. Councillor MacDonald. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll, I'll start the ball rolling and... Firstly, through you, Madam Chair, to General Manager Mike and to Rod, um, thank you for bringing this comprehensive report with a variety of options for us to consider as councillors. And uh, Mr Brodie, I, I also appreciate the, uh, the variance from looking at two different lenses as options for this, one being a premium price for a guaranteed parking and the other being through the Bitsios report um, around a car parking strategy which, which talks about um, utilising price as one of those 
ways in which we can move people from car park to car park where they're underutilised. And I've probably put a lens in the, in the latter through my option that I'd, I'd like to put forward to the group today just to start the, the conversation and discussion. And the option, uh, option four, but with variance, and taking on board what um, the chair mentioned in regard to sometimes the car park is full, I, th I think if it was possible, and it seems it is through the, the various designs, to have 110 authorised parks and still remain 50 public parks for the top. And then when we go, when we go down to, to pricing, um, albeit the option of the premium may well be the guaranteed space, um, it's still an outside car park on a roof. So I, that's my justification and the other is of course to utilise the unutilised car park and, and really use this as an opportunity to, to test, if you like, the Bitsy Off report, which was to use prices as opportunities. And the reason that it's come to Council initially was because there has been uh, inquiries on many occasions through subsequent years in regard to the possibility of um, Council providing permanent um, secure parking or, or regulated parking for themselves. So the pricing that I've proposed, um, based on the fact that the current pricing is $9 per day uh, to park there, would be a three-scale approach. 850, Councillor McDonald. Plus, well, GST probably needs to be added onto that as well. No. Uh, no. So three months, three months, now you might want to write this down if you'd like to, um, based on um, $10.90, so that is a premium for three months. For six months, $8.90. And for 12 months, $12, uh, $6.90. So I'll just repeat that. Three months, $10.90. Six months, $8.90. And 12 months, $6.90. And the reasons I've outlined prior is, is why I've come up with those figures. Again, these may be seen as arbitrary, but I've used the standard $8.50 price per uh, car park as the, gu as the guide. And then taken in the comments of the general manager in regard to premium for three months and in this case six months, but the 12 months does, does give that opportunity for um, shop owners, retailers, whoever may like to purchase a 12 month uh, park at a reduced rate for those 12 months. And with the 50 public parks still paying, if you get 90% of those um, get filled, you're still paying the $8.50 the return on council in the first year is, uh, is above what the current return is based on the 90 car parks. It's taught, spoken about in the report, 90 of 160 on average, uh, which is around $180,000 net return. Uh, the net return in this model is uh, give or take around about the $215,000 mark. So it's, it's consistent uh, with the current situation, but it does give us as a council, an opportunity to do what the community has asked of, which is to consider a uh, authorised permitted parking for three, six and 12 months. So that's the proposal I've put forward to start the conversation, Madam Chair. So thank you, Mr Chair. I'm not sure that there's been an overwhelming request from the community uh, for long-term car parking, but um, I think, um, yeah, thank you. That's a starting point. Um, Councillor Onhoff. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just um, in relation to Councillor McDonald's um, proposal here, can we get clarification on the GST? Yeah, so the, the present charge at the car park is $8.50 a day, okay, and that's inclusive GST. Inclusive. Okay, so that's the present charge uh, when you go through the boom gates. Mm. Um, and I would... Uh, inclusive GST. Yeah, All inclusive. I'd our car parking in use. this report, in recommendation one, we're saying the price is being indicated here, and I think Councillor McDonald's indicated that these prices would be inclusive of, uh, in his mind, of GST. Which excludes just right now, please. Six months, sorry. Six months is $8.90. I think uh, just on the public well, when you took it down to asking the people who were using the top part of the car park, who were actually using it, they were against long-term car parking. So uh, the, in that last report, there were a lot of different um, ways of looking at the car parking there and perhaps 
should go back and have a look at that. I mean, really, uh, councillors, this is public car parks. They belong to the community, so um, you just need to be very aware. I, I don't believe there's been an overwhelming um, response from the community for long-term car parking. It guaranteed, but there has been some people in that space. At the end of the day, we need to be very careful to do the right thing for everyone in the community. A any other comment? Councillor Ashe. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. So are these are these prices now that they're updated? So that's what it is. Sorry. So at if at that price, so six ninety per day is. Oh, sorry. No, we haven't updated the. I haven't got. It. So you're saying six ninety a day based on twelve months. 365 days a year. Yeah, the, the, the numbers to the right of those aren't updated though. Yeah, okay. So what's... Actually, six, uh, 1973 40 would be the... So could I just ask the, the CEO if he could just clarify that and we could put it up? Thanks, Wendy. Yeah. I can't see it, so... So the... It's our, our interpretation of your... Uh, re, of your uh, variation or amendment would be ten dollars ninety a day for five days per week mm -hmm. for three for, three, for three months. Right. Um, so it'd be based on a five day. So there's that uh, element. Two hundred and sixty working days. Yep. So the same same approach that's been taken. Right. Same, in, sorry, Madam Chair. The rest of the report. Same same structure, same process. So for three months it would be seven seven nine thirty five. Six months. 12.72.70 for 12 months, 1973.40. Is that right? Hang on, hang on. No, no, that's, that's, no sorry, that's, retract that. Yeah. Three months at $708.50, please. Three months at $708.50, that's worked on 260 working days. And in these, we need to consider how many parks as well, not just the cost. 11.57 for six months. And for 12 months, 17.94. Okay. And that's with, thank you, Madam Chair, for raising that. That's with 110 parks available only and 50 left to the public. Thank you. Councillor O'Shea? Yeah, thanks. Madam Chair, I think the, the, the issue I have with what we're talking about this is, a, is as a premium facility. I, I, in all due respect, I don't believe it is. If it was a premium facility, why is there so many vacancies, I guess, is, more, is, is why we've sort of reached, reached this particular point. So when I look around at the other, and we've got a really good comprehensive look at what other private exists around us, 1440 across the road at um, McCafferty's and Chronicle Lane, I think it's 1584. So we're probably offering a similar service. Would I, would I, would I be right in saying it, as to what they are? So, I mean, I think when we talk about market value and where we want to set our price, and I agree 100% with what the point that Councillor McDonald raised before, it's around incentive driven by price. So I feel if we were offering the recommendation that's there, whatever that figure that was put forward, I, I actually think that's a disincentive to park there. As I said, at the prices at the moment, we, and we had a couple of different examples during the, the COVID period when it was free and there wasn't 20 cars up there. And that, that's when it was free. So the incentive that we're providing here is a guaranteed car park, but it needs to be at a price that is that, that is considered market value or, or reasonable for a, for a consumer. So, I think we're closer to the mark with with some of, with some of these figures. Um, the question I had just around, if I can ask as well, please, Madam Chair, through yourself to Mr. Brady, is around the part there in the report says that we need to add in additional security cameras. Don't, I, I, don't, I don't quite understand that. Just around the fact that I know we've got um, nearly 700 cameras in our network and over a hundred, I think there's 106 or some number around that are in the actual city safe area. And a lot of those cover this actual car park. So I don't quite understand the need or, you know. I, I don't, we, we don't, there's none on the top floor, I don't believe. Yeah. There is. There's none. Yeah, there is. 
I've been there, sorry, with all due respect, Madam Chair, I've been in the facility and they have pointed out different areas of everything that they can see on that car park and I won't explain the story they saw on the rooftop. Can I just ask Rodney to clarify that? Well, we'll have to find that out, but um, I have to say a um, comment about COVID. Annan Street car park wasn't full either, so there just wasn't anyone coming into town. I don't think we can um, consider what's happened during COVID. Um, so, there, so there was uh, in the Rodney's going to find out. So. Apologies. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in that sixty thousand, there's around uh, I think it was in forty thousand putting in the card readers signage and those sorts of things, and about $20,000 in camera and lighting upgrades. So... Sorry, Mike, can you please just repeat? Can you just go... Sorry. Up? Sorry, sorry. Apologies, councillors. Um, it is difficult in here with the yeah. echoing. So in that 60000 um, as noted um, in the uh, page 8 of 10 of the report, there's about 40,000 associated with the installation of car readers, signage and other equipment necessary to manage the authorised long-term parking area, and 20,000 for the installation of additional lighting and cameras on the top deck. I've just asked Rod just to check with Moray on the effectiveness of those cameras in regards to what we were looking at, but um, that, that's um, the funding that was suggested. And Mr Brady, I guess that the, the lighting would have to be updated because it is rather dismal up there at night time. Yeah. Well, that, that's why we've um, mm. suggested if you're putting in something that you're giving a level of guarantee to, um, as we've said, if once a person pays for a spot, they can leave the car there 24-7. Um, that does sort of... It's probably putting a greater onus on us uh, to ensure that those yeah. spaces or those cars are are reasonably well protected from, or secure from... We're actually responsible, I suggest. Uh, Councillor Melissa? In offering that service. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks, Mike, and to Rod in his absence. Amazing work. Oh, there's been a lot of work on there. Absolutely. Um, but I, I think your point of the lighting and the security cameras actually goes to an argument for uh, guaranteed long-term parking and increasing the parking on that level, because if I'm a parker, we're in the city and I know that there's going to be increased lighting and increased security um, mm. cameras on that top deck, then I would probably be more inclined to park on there. So I, I, I think putting that, that vital safety infrastructure on the top will actually increase, or hopefully, increase um, those um, parking on the top level, because I know I would. Certainly, it'll increase the surveillance of it, so that's much better. Yeah, and I, I mm. think that would then give me um, a safety assurance mm. um, of parking there rather than down a dark alley in another mm. street. And I think, you know, I think the only car covered car park council... Council's one of the only councils that owns off-street car park. Very few councils own in Queensland. And um, actually, the only other one we have is Grand Central covered or... Um, or underneath this car park in the bus uh, on the first level. But, I mean, this car parking is just as uh, premium as what Annan Street is and others, and there is a lift there, so... And, it, you know, they've got plenty of um, uh, protected walking. And just to follow on from that, if... I, I think we should do that regardless whether mm, we're long-term... I do too. ..or not, because that is still accessible to the public after hours. So whether we do long-term guaranteed parking or not, I think we as a council, as a duty of care and a chain of responsibility, should put cameras and lighting in there. So whether this goes ahead or not, I think it's something from a safety perspective for the safety of our um, constituents um, that we put that up there. Thank you, Councillor Melissa. I agree. Any, any other comments? Rodney. So perhaps Rodney? <coughs> Just to clarify. Okay, there are both city safe cameras and uh, some cameras on the lower deck that look at the uh, where people pay for parking, the entry gate and the exit gate. So they're uh, traffic cameras. There is a city safe camera on the eastern parapet, which is generally looking at the street down in Neal Street. Uh, it's generally got its back turned to the actual car park uh, for an authorised area and to have. Uh, proper surveillance of that, we were proposing one if not two cameras to uh, properly monitor that secure area. 
Thank you. Thank you, Rodney, for finding that out. Councillor Nancy, I think you were next. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just worrying I'm going to begin a bidding war here <laughs> in relation to the pricing. But look, I sort of chewed the fat on this quite a bit over the weekend about how I thought it should be. And um, I came up with um, $600 for three months, 1040 for six and 1600 for 12 months, um, meaning there's a bit of penalty for, for those that are not locking in for the full 12 months. But I looked at my pricing compared to Councillor McDonald's suggestion and, and it's nearly a GST variance between my price and, and Councillor McDonald's. So, and given that GST is inclusive in it, I really would like to recommend the 600, 1,040 and 1,600. And my reason being is it's close to that 1,574, I think it is, which is um, in Chronicle Lane. And I just think that that's um, quite comparative then, that we're not... Um, we're not too cheap and we're not too expensive that deters this changing pattern, which is what we're trying to get. We're trying to get a change of people's habits from parking in the street when they work in the street and or work in the shops in the street, I should clarify, um, and that they actually park up there and not in, in the um, parking spaces, which are important for customers to in continue that economic development in our CBD. Uh, councillors, I think you're probably thinking that it's empty all the time. This car park isn't, if you go back to the previous report, and you'll find that for October, November, December, and in one day, in one month in particular, it was nearly oversubscribed. So we need to be very careful when we're making our decision that we're not costing ourselves money. I think there's been varying views on that and varying um, uh, inspections of it from, from various people, including surveys and all sorts of things. But at the end of the day, um, I think it's important that we actually fill that where possible. Most importantly for me is to get those cars off the street so the customers can go into those businesses. To me, that's key to this whole process that we're going through at the moment is to uh, stimulate economic development within our CBD, which the business people in, in the CBD are crying out for. Thank you, Councillor Summerfield. Councillor Macdonald, you were next, I think. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I was just touching on, and Councillor Summerfield probably touched on it there, around competitive neutrality um, with uh, private car parks that are near or close by to that area. And I just wondered through you to Mike whether competitive neutrality is, is a something that we should be careful of or aware of as a council. Yeah, it's to mentioned in the reports, Councillor Macdonald. But the other thing about Chronicle Lane, I just wanted to say, you can't leave a car there all night and it's not, it's not under surveillance. So uh, that's just... Um, Councillor, Councillor Carl, you are next. Madam Chair, I just worry about uh, us making the investment in the context of free parking in the city square. And if we're serious about um, proper spend of public funds, maybe we need to look at the Bitsios report again um, in its entirety and see what they suggest about um, the move from free parking to paid parking in the city centre. And um, it would be much easier to get sentiment uh, and investment and it'd be, in my view, a much sounder investment in infrastructure into guaranteed off-street uh, parking, whereas um, yeah, it might be underutilised, um, and there's some conjecture around that. I'm not, I'm not willing mm -hmm. to enter into that, but um, I just think it'd be a much sounder investment if we looked at, rather than pick pieces out of this, that we look, we revisit the car parking strategy for the city centre and, and um, build on that as around sensible investment. Um, I just wonder what the return on our, on our investment will be when we're given the figures that the, the do-nothing scenario, we're already making money on it. So we're going to invest in infrastructure to give a level uh, of um, satisfaction for a paid uh, or a fee for service or however you want to put that. Yeah. Anyway. Um. Thank you, Councillor Carl. There will be construction in the city centre too, so I think that uh, this, these car parks will be in great demand. Councillor Melissa. Thank you. Um, thank you through you, Madam Chair. 
Um, I, I think it's really important that we look at this guaranteed parking uh, from a positive point of view. We need to change the thinking and the behaviours of the current parking in the city because if we don't change it, we won't get the desired outcome that's required for the businesses in the city. I think by changing the free parking in the middle of the city, we'll um, have anarchy in the CBD from businesses and I think we need to actually change the thinking of the business owners and their staff and by giving them a price incentive to park on the top of the car park will increase will change the behaviors and parking of those that are working in the CBD and hopefully bring them up to the top level which then will then free up the customer car parking, which is imperative for the small businesses in the CBD, so, uh, for the customers to be able to come in very quickly, park, and then go into the businesses. Um, customers won't park on the top level and go downstairs, shop, and then go back up. So I, I think by right. having guaranteed parking, and then also guaranteed parking, 110 car parks, seven days a week, 24, day, 24 hours a day is guaranteed money in the kitty if we sell it. And I think it all comes down to the marketing and the selling of it and canvassing the opportunities that it gives to businesses. And that's what the one hour parking is for the customers. Right. And that's what we need to... Many businesses yeah. do, do pay. Thank you. I tend to agree with you. Councillor Rebecca? Oh, you didn't have your hand up. I thought you did. Uh, I, well, yeah. I did actually just um, when... Uh, when Council MacDonald was asking the question about com competitive neutrality, and I see on page six and seven of mm. the we talk about competitive risks, but it's, it's mine. to also get an answer about whether or not we're running into issues with competitive neutrality if we consider Councillor Summerfield's um, proposed amounts and Councillor MacDonald's proposed amounts. Well, at the moment, they're just thrown there, so we don't know. I'd have probably asked the CEO would he, if he wanted to count, comment on that. Mike, you can. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, councillors, it is an issue. Um, and I think it's, it's sort of been picked up, I think, in the suggestion from uh, Councillor MacDonald in the, the pricing that he's put there, is that our... if Number number one, we, we normally don't get involved in a market space. It doesn't matter what the business is, where the private sector is involved. So as councillors, a public sector organisation, we normally don't get involved with this. And there's numerous... Um, places around the city where you can go and park your vehicle and have uh, under some financial arrangement with the owners of that land. Um, put that aside, the council's um, sort of putting that aside for the moment. Um, in getting involved then, you do have to be careful uh, how you go forward in the costing or the, the, the pricing uh, of how... Um, the parkings put out there in that sort of public realm, you you are competing against that private market share out there. So, pending on the rates, um, you know, as we saw within the tenders uh, in item five, um, and what we've seen in that report, where it's uh, noted, you know, there's a lot of car parks around the area, not just there, but around the city, around about that five dollars a day. Mm. Um, if we, if we go in at or below those sorts of rates, uh, you know, five to six dollars a day, um, we are probably trying to pull people away from, from those markets or those um, private, private people. So I think we, we do need to be careful um, at if you are going to be setting a price, if you see that's the way you wish to go, that it doesn't have that effect, that it's... In, in essence, it's not, as you're saying, the reasoning is not to be competitive to other private market providers. This is really more to do more broadly with our strategy as a whole and also to get utilisation of the top deck of the car park up. So I think caution dropping the price too far. Um, so then a supplementary, if I might, Madam Chair. So specifically then, if I'm hearing what you're saying correctly, there's no issue with Councillor McDonald's because on a per day basis, we don't enter into um, that same that same uh, price bracket that some of the lowest um, 
charges are. And Councillor Summerfield, do we um, uh, do we enter into? Are we still safe with your prices as well? I don't think so. Thank you. If I could just comment through you, Madam Chair. Same thank you. Um, so I just did the sums quickly again then, and um, Councillor McDonald's six dollars ninety is only relative to five days per week. So to get the seven days per week at the five dollars that you mentioned, Mike, would be eighteen hundred and twenty-five. You mentioned the five dollars, so that we weren't um, going lower than the going rate around the place. You're saying it's five dollars per day for seven days a week. Um, is that well, right? there's a variance of um, the uh, private sector. They aren't just one price, but that five dollars to about six dollars a day uh, tends to be the range that we've seen around the city. Whether they charge their people. Um, as a weekly or on a on a daily basis, I'm not sure, and if there's other details. I, th I think we just need to be cautious in this area. Um, there's no... Um, it, it's the perception as much as anything else as well, councillors, that uh, as well as the reality mm. of what we're starting to get involved with. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got Councillor James, Councillor Megan, and then uh, Councillor Melissa. Thanks, Madam Chair. Just on that, um, Mike, so what perception are we sending the general public by suggesting that we charge that um, the amount recommended in this 2,000-something? I understand uh, your point. Uh, as I said, I think the officer's recommendation, councillors, has been very much around the economics. If we're going to go down this track, we shouldn't be aiming to go backwards in the money we, we get no. in the order of... 450,000 plus out of the car park for COVID per annum, of which about a third of that is coming out of the top deck of the car park, okay? So whatever pricing we put forward, taking into account the capital investment that you've got to do, the operational ongoing costs, we're suggesting to you from an office perspective that it needs to be a reasonable fee uh, that is going to cover the costs and ultimately hopefully put council in front of the game economically. Um, council's budget is, you know, it's got strain in, in all areas operationally. Uh, we don't have any money in here for the capital at present. We don't have any money in, in here for the ongoing operations in our budgets. So we're putting forward a, call it a business case, that if you wish to go down this track, it's one that um, economically is one that can stand up reasonably uh, going forward. And I think, the, you know, put aside the, you know, the perceptions of um, potential competitiveness in the market when you're giving guaranteed parking. Uh, just supplementary, please, Madam Chair. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate the response, Mr Brady. But I think Council's role is obviously to support the, the, the community. And I mean, one of the key things I took out that we identified through the survey and, and what we've done there is is one of the, and it was listed highly on as one of the current um, most well, most needed in improvement opportunities exists for council is support business and investment attraction to create jobs and strengthen the, re the region's economies. So using that as a, as a statement of where um, it, it is perceived obviously that council can help support the community. I mean, we've talked a lot about the CBD, uh, we've heard a lot about the CBD, etc. So, council isn't just the, wholly and solely the one responsible, obviously, for fixing it. But council has a role to play in assisting the private sector in in this game. Essentially, now we often hear that the number one fallback for business in the CBD is a lack of parking, and as Councillor McDonald raised in his first uh, statement in, in the, on this topic, is in, and around guaranteed parking for staff and yep we understand obviously centre parking etc is there for for customers and we have a we have a squeeze on all day parking because again i keep coming back to i know we can um debate how many are parking here or where well, i'll give you one guarantee that we do know and that is our annan street car parks are fully subscribed all day every day if you leave at 11 o'clock your park will be gone by 11.01 so they're in high demand we talk about having this other premium facility why is it? Why is there ever even a vacancy? Why are people not parking there? And as we mentioned as well earlier, around changing people's behaviours and understanding, if we can have 
110, whatever number is that, workers parking on the rooftop at a reasonable price that is competitive around, I think the best market for that is the two that sit directly beside it. One sits at 1440, the other sits at 1584. So we need to be in that ballpark to, to meet council's obligation, or just a community perception obligation of being um, competitive when it, when it comes to, uh, to pricing. But that then all of a sudden changes people's behaviours around where they park. Because if there's 110 that are up there that are workers, that's 110 other parks that are available across these other areas that we've got the, the squeeze on at the moment. So it's all about utilising these spaces that we have. And I think, as well, we just need to think about the options and possibilities that this certainly does open up for, for council and how we want to work with different groups, chambers of commerce and et cetera, around how we can help to promote the opportunity for all day parking for, for workers in the CBD. I just think this is a great opportunity <coughs> to give something different a go and that's what it's about. It's about changing things so we need to do something differently. As I said, this car park up there has sat there for a long period of time. It's in a prime location. It should be utilised all the time but the reality is it is not. And this is a way of changing it and hopefully having an opportunity for it to be used. So summary of all of that, I'm quite supportive of, of, the, of the figures, both the figures wherever they sit that have been put forward. I, I think they're around the mark and I think that's something that we can go out to public with and, and, and offer a service here that, that, that then we throw open to the public and the public will decide if there's demand for it or not. Thank you, Councillor O'Shea. I'd point out to you that October, November, December nearly fully occupied and if we do nothing we get 180,800 partly occupied and 321,400. We don't need to give public money away so whatever we do we need to be mindful of that. Councillor Megan? Maybe go to the mayor's microphone. Yeah. <laughs> just for the people watching, we're all quite cold in here, so we've just been issued with little blankets, Rug, knee rugs. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question um, is around the accuracy of the data in terms of, um, you know, this one. Someone saying that you know it's it's full, it's not full. Like, do we have accurate data about how full it is? I'd ask Rodney to comment on that. There certainly has been, a, I guess, a level of data Closer. provided to Council in previous reports around it. Uh, there is not actual vehicle monitoring at the bus station in terms of actual numbers, so a lot of our projections are off the, the cash flows. But that said, the cash flows are fairly consistent over time prior to COVID-19 and we simply haven't had any recent data because there hasn't been any, uh, with the free parking particularly during uh, May and June, uh, we have no way of really, other than sending people down there to do physical counts every day. Uh, back in July last year when Council's interest was first coming around this topic, we did uh, send people down there for um, a, a random scattering of days for the month and we came back and uh, endeavoured to correlate those sort of observations with the financial figures and there was a reasonable degree of correlation there. Um, the bus station is used by not just uh, all day parkers but by people coming in for three or four hours into the CBD. So yes, there are a number of assumptions inherent in it um, as there are in this report with assumptions of how many people might take up tickets depending on what the price council sits, uh, sets for it. So it is a little bit difficult to be totally specific and, and quantifiable. Uh, if we had sensors in every parking space, yes, I could give you totally accurate numbers, but we simply don't. Just that Thanks, Rob. Just thank you, Madam Chair, that, um, you, you know, we've got a camera up there, which I, I imagine that we could put on to the... Ca the Faces the street for, for surveillance of safety in the, in the street. Well, I mean, it just seems we're sort of making decisions on arbitrary type data, which worries me. Um, the other question I was going to ask was, uh, well, to, to um, make us think about, if, if workers are the type of people who are shifting their car every hour, are they going to then pay to... It, it doesn't seem to see, be the same... Want it for nothing, <laughs> yeah. They won't pay, no. 
Well, I don't know about teachers. Oh, this is mostly though. Look, I, I my hairdresser pays somebody two for two car parks behind him in another little lane up here behind Market Street. So a lot of business owners are in the situation where they are paying. I I, I don't know what the percentage is, but quite a few business owners pay for their leading staff. They do pay car parking money for them uh, with private enterprise at the moment. So. Okay. okay so we. Just if I can, okay. look, statistically speaking, the information that we have, the, the correlation of the dollars that Rod and the team have done, and the um, one-off, uh, or when I say one-off, or the um, car parking counts that have been done, is a reasonable a industry approach to getting a, when you don't have the actual you know, sensors, to get a, a good feel of, w of where, um, how the car park is performing. So I think the data that we've provided to you is quite robust uh, in its uh, in the usage, uh, and this was, you know, a lot of that was in that previous item, item five, um, uh, different tables in there. So I, I believe what we have calculated, what we've put forward to you, uh, has a, f a significant robustness to it in regards to you to make an informed decision as a councillor on this matter, which. I think, to me, distilling the discussions, if council wishes to go forward with this, it really just comes down to the price. What price do you want to charge? Um, there's pros and cons at any, you know, lower down, it brings in different risks. Higher up, it brings in different risks. So picking the, the point where you think as a council is the right, right point. Um, so that's, I think that's what it comes down to at the end of the day, if you want to go ahead with this uh, initiative. Thanks, Mike. Um, Councillor um, Melissa. Thank you. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to make a point that we need to compare apples for apples. So when mm. we're looking at pricing, um, the, basically we're basing it on 24-7 access, but mm. we're basing the charges on 260 working days a year. So if you're going to look at uh, Councillor McDonald's 1794, for the 12 months, that actually works out at $6.90 a day. And at the 1600 is 1615, sorry, 615 a day, $6.15 a day. So we're actually not undercutting private enterprise at all, I don't think. And the private enterprise car parks, from the information I've been given, um, is oversubscribed. That's true. You, yeah. You're actually not cutting private enterprise out of the market. And I think too that at $2,000 plus a year, we're actually um, moving into the private sector of making a profit. Mm. And being competitive. Like, competitive. We're, we're not here to make a profit. No. A, a massive profit on car parking. We want to provide a service. So Break even. If you charge a premium price and you actually are moving into the private sector um, area for making a profit. So I, I think at the 1794 and the 1600, we're actually playing in a similar area. Hmm. Councillor Bill? Yeah. You, had, you had your hand up. Premium price, I don't think you'll be um, worried about too much uh, competition from private sector. I mean, you won't, if you ask too much, you won't get the clientele. I don't think there's going to be any worry from private sector. I go back to my statement. I just wonder about the, the uh, appropriateness of our investment at this time, independently of other uh, factors that we should be really looking at. And it's not just for the benefit of the business owner, it's for the benefit of the general public that utilises, and it is just not the public in the vicinity of the CBD, it's the public from Yarraman that occasionally will mm. come to Toowoomba for hierarchy of shopping that they don't have in their uh, community of interest of Kingaroy even. So, yeah, I just wonder, um, we should be, if we're really, really serious about this, um, uh, and I agree with Councillor Megan's comments, if people are prepared to shuffle cars while ever there's free car parking, are they going to be prepared to pay um, for car parking? Mm. And Councillor Bill, I do am aware that any big event at the Empire, it's well utilised. So 
if they come in? I'm not against um, providing uh, assistance for the businesses, but in the context of the, the, uh, the um, importance of real estate in the CBD, and I might add the most important real estate is the CBD mm -hmm. um, for everyone and accessibility. Um, in, for, you know, to be not sound too harsh, but uh, there are lots of businesses that give their back teeth to be in the CBD conducting their business. Mm -hmm. It is a privilege, aside from whether they have parking or not. So mm -hmm. I just think that we, we need to be mindful that we're going to, and the general manager has more than appropriately outlined the bu budgetary shortfalls to implement this. This is nothing in there. Operating costs, mm. the ongoing whole of life cost to so-called provide a service to a small sector of the community. And in that um, report is that what, even at those bigger prices, it's going to take two years to before there's any kind of a break even because of the money that has to be spent. Councillor uh, Rebecca. Thanks, Counts uh, Madam Chair. Um, so while I appreciate um, Councillor Carl's perspective and your perspective, my primary motivation is this, is in this matter, is economic development and reinvigorating the CBD. So to my mind, what we're doing here potentially has twofold benefit for our businesses. And the first is it's convenient for the workers. They don't have to think about where they're going to find a park in the day. They just they get their coffee on their way to work, they find the park, off they go. It's a routine and it's a habit and that's convenient. So it'll be used for that. The second thing is that it frees up parks for customers to use on the street level. So um, this is about reinvigorating the CBD. I'm in favour of it. I support Councillor Summerfield's amounts that are listed here. If there's not support for those, I would also support Councillor um, McDonald's okay. amounts as well. Answers. Sorry, thank you. Okay, I'm just finding it hard to see something here. That's all, sorry. Councillor... Okay, thank you. I just haven't got a screen here. Um, Councillor Nancy? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Look, I'd just like to briefly jot back to the data and my recollection of the data that was done back when it was done was that the counts were done, I think it was every Wednesday of the month. So there was no variation of the days that people went up and, and counted or however they went about counting the number of people parked up there. And so to me, that could be skewed um, insofar as, and uh, Councillor Taylor mentioned earlier about Empo Theatre, well, morning melodies, I think, are on a Wednesday. So if, if that was the case, that would skew that data as well. But I just want to, wanted to mention that briefly before, I think, at the end of the day, the nuts and bolts of this whole thing that we're stuck on is setting a price. So if people didn't want to support my proposal, and I'm more than happy for that discussion to be had, um, I would also more than welcome... Um, support Councillor McDonald's because I do believe we do need to have a cheaper option that will drive people to change their habits which will um, stimulate the CBD economy. economy. And I just asked the CEO to comment on this. I think we can change it. It's up, it'll be under fees and charges, won't it? So that we'd be, because it's under fee and char fees and charges, it could be changed. But my understanding is a lot of construction coming in the CBD in, in, the, in the coming... Um, close proximity and I think that we'll find that they'll be used anyway, whatever you set. So um, I think, one, do we do it? That's one thing. Number two, we can't just keep having figures plucked out of the air. Where do we start? What do we start on? Chair, I'm, yeah. I'm happy to move a motion with a slight... Well, we're in a closed session, so maybe just... Open session. Oh, no, we are. I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I've forgotten. Slight change. Based on the conversation, the reason I put those numbers up were the reasons that I outlined earlier, which was around... Similar to Councillor Vondhoff, similar Councillor Summerfield, similar Councillor Taylor and, and similar to Councillor O'Shea mentioning around the economics of it, but also around the opportunity we have to reflect on the Bitsios report that talks about shifting the, 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 the places where people park. That's, that was the motivation. Okay, so the numbers I've come up with, which is very similar to both Councillor Summerfield and the first proposal, and in line with the conversation that's been had, talks about um, the, the very important issue of competitive neutrality. Yes. 
and, and that, that being the case for, uh, which order have you got it in there, Wendy? Three months, three months first, $10.45, and I'd like you to put that in there, that number if you could, at a total of uh, 6.78.25. Okay, the six months at eight dollars eighty, which is still slightly over what mm. uh, the normal price would be, but you get a secure park in in a in a place that's got cameras and it's got all those things that Councillor Melissa Taylor spoke of, which is why she would be motivated to to park there. Eight dollars eighty, which is eleven hundred and forty four dollars, and the final one, which is twelve months, at six dollars sixty. Keeping in mind the comments of General Manager Brady and uh, supported by Mr Betts around the $5 to $6 amount, so $6.60, which is slightly less and consistent with Councillor Summerfield's uh, amount, which gives uh, a total of seventeen sixteen. Mm. And I, I, I thank you for your indulgence there, Councillor Taylor, because the reason I put it up first was so this discussion could take mm. place. And it's been a very good discussion, I have to say. Yes, it has. Uh, I've landed on that and, and happy to move it with those numbers. Thank you, Councillor McDonald. We have a seconder, Councillor Summerfield. Um, do we have any debate on that? If we have no debate, I'll take the vote. Those in favour? Those against? It's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Councillors. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr Brady, and thank you, Mr Betts. Thank you. No, thank you, councillors. Um, so we still have an item. Still Just check. Was that then clarified as an amendment? Because if it was, we. No, it's only committee. So. Oh, that's. No, right. it's only committee. Yeah, sorry. We can. It's just a, uh, just something that wasn't moved. Once it's moved, it becomes a, uh, a motion. It's a commission re committee recommendation to the meeting next week. Right. Yep. Now we've got another closed session, I'm sorry. So can I have someone move? Councillor McDonald, Councillor Summerfield, those in favour? It's carried, thank you. So we have...
Now we're in a closed session, in open session. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair. Councillor Shine. I move that option two, as recommended, uh, be adopted. Oh, sorry. Yes, um, my, my apologies, Councillor Shine. We need to go back to the first one we've done in a closed session, uh, which is um, item... Item seven. Item seven, and the three of you will need to, uh, you'll need, two of you need to make a declaration again. Sorry, Councillor Von Hoff. Okay. Just hold on a sec, Councillor, are we right, Cage? Thank you. So this regards item number seven, uh, and I've got a declared conflict of interest pursuant to section 175E of the Local mm -hmm. Government Act 2009. Mm -hmm. I would like to inform the meeting that I have a personal interest in this matter, which I recognise may be a real or perceived conflict of interest, the particulars of which are as follows. The nature of the interest is I have a close personal relationship and am a neighbour to the landholders mentioned in the report. I will be dealing with this declared conflict of interest by leaving the meeting while this matter is discussed and voted on. Thank you to Councillor Von Hoff. Uh, Councillor Schoen. Likewise, uh, pursuant to section 175E of the Local Government Act 2009, I'd like to inform the meeting that I have a personal interest in this matter, which I recognise may be a real or perceived conflict of interest, the particulars of which are as follows. The nature of the interest is I have a personal relationship with one of the landholders mentioned in this report, as one of the landholders is my doctor. I will be dealing with this declared conflict of interest by leaving the meeting while this matter is discussed and voted on. Thank you, Councillor Schoen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Pursuant to Section 175E of the Local Government Act 2009, I'd like to inform the meeting that I have a personal interest in the matter which I recognise may be a real or perceived conflict of interest, the particulars of which are as follows. The nature of the interest is I have a personal relationship with one of the landholders mentioned in this report as one of the landholders is my doctor. However, given the circumstances of just an annual visit, I'd ask that the fellow councillors decide whether I uh, can stay in the room and uh, participate in the vote. And thank you, Councillor Macdonald. The councillor has made that declaration, has made that decision. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor Schoen. Thank you, councillors. Item seven. Uh, moved, Councillor Macdonald. Seconded, Councillor Melissa Taylor. Those in favour? It's carried, thank you. Can you get them back? Thanks. Thank you, councillors. We move on to item nine. Uh, Councillor Shine, you wanted to, um, you move the? Yes, I moved. Thank you, moved Councillor Shine. Seconded Councillor O'Hara Sullivan. Those in favour? It's carried, thank you. That ends the infrastructure committee meeting for July. Thank you very much to council, the mayor and council, and to our staff, and particularly to Rodney and Mike for such a lot of work on our items for this month. Thank you. Thank you, CEO and Wendy, of course. Thank you. Are we back? And now we go to planning. Sorry. Yeah. Do I leave the radio? Leave. Committee meeting, um, and I need someone to move that we go into confidential. 
McDonald, Shine. All those in favour? Carried. Uh
Um, can I have someone move the um, Development Services Appeals Report? Councillor Carl? Yep. And Councillor MacDonald, all those in favour? It is carried. And could I have a mover for the Regional End Board? Yes, oh. Yeah. So, yeah. with item one removed, and the item one is as per mentioned earlier, which was pursuant to section 175E of the Local Government Act 2009, I'd like to inform the meeting that I have a personal interest in the matter, which I recognise may be a real or perceived conflict of interest, the particulars of which are as follows. The nature of the interest is that I'm a resident in the same street as a subject property referred to in item one of the schedule of matters in Progress in the Planning Environment Court and or in the Magistrates Court. Enforcement actions I'll be dealing with this declared conflict of interest by leaving the meeting whilst this matter is discussed and voted on. Councillor O'Shea. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, declaration of a conf conflict of interest pursuant of Section 175E of the Local Government Act 2009. I wish to inform the meeting that I have a personal interest in this matter, which I recognise may be a real or perceived conflict of interest, the particulars of which are as follows. The nature of the interest is myself and my spouse engaged a builder to work on a property owned by us. The builder has then engaged the company referred to in item one of the schedule of matters in progress in the planning and environment court and or in the magistrate's court enforcement actions. I will be dealing with this de declared conflict of interest by leaving the meeting while the matter is discussed and voted on. Thank you. Uh, so, councillors, can I have um, a mover for the recommendation number one, which deals with item one of the schedule? Councillor Bonhoff, Councillor McMahon, all those in favour? It's carried. Those blokes can come back. And can I have someone uh, move for recommendation number two, which deals with the balance of items on that schedule? So Councillor O'Shea and Councillor Antonio, all those in favour? It's carried, lunchtime. That's the conclusion Madam Chair, can of, you just, yes. just work through the afternoon sessions, if you don't mind? Um, Brian, I, I did send through a meeting slip. Oh, just, thank oh. you, the meeting's concluded, thank you.